What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. All right, members of the Rob Corps, uh, I am, I'm nervous about this. <laughs> I'm nervous about running over Jeff John's Green Lantern Rebirth because there's, God, there's so much history here. I mean, this is one of the most beautifully written stories that I've seen in a long time, just from like a history standpoint. I mean, just from the standpoint of a person that loves history and comic books, there's so much here. So uh, because of the fact that there is a lot, we're gonna do two things. One, I'll defer you to my video on Hal Jordan Explained where you'll find a lot of the backstory there. But what we're also gonna do for those of you guys that just don't have the time to, to watch that whole video, we're gonna kind of cross that bridge as we get to it when it comes to like these different aspects of Hal Jordan's history. But the first thing we do here is we really just kind of pick up with, with uh, Kyle Rayner actually crash landing on Earth and coming out of the sun. Now, the cool thing about this is when it comes to the different Green Lanterns that we've had, at least up to the point of Green Lantern Rebirth by Jeff Johns, Kyle Rayner is the new kid on the block. I mean, he's still the newest one. I wouldn't go as far as to say, you know, that he's, uh, he's green around the ears, but I would go as far as to say that he's just he's the newest guy. I mean, really, the, the chronology in terms of the different Green Lanterns as they were introduced uh, was, of course, Alan Scott, you know, the one who was introduced during the Golden Age, followed by Hal Jordan, Guy Gardner, John Stewart, and then Kyle Rayner. But it creates some really compelling things, too. It's just, you know, a lot of the themes that have been wrapped up, that have kind of been left hanging, are effectively being wrapped up, actually, by, by Jeff Johns himself. But, you know, with Kyle Rayner getting here, his ring has really seems to have been usurped, or at least drawn, uh, of almost all of its power. But then he also tells these two people who discover him, fear has a name. Fear has an actual name. Now, at this point, we jump to Carol Ferris. Now, something to keep in mind here is that there was a point prior to Jeff John's uh, run on Green Lantern where Carol Ferris was a Star Sapphire. She was the Star Sapphire. The difference is that as far as I'm aware, the Star Sapphires, uh, it was only, it was it was like one Star Sapphire. There wasn't like a whole group of them like what Jeff John's did, uh, but it was really more of like a position a person was appointed to and imbued with the power of the Star Sapphire as opposed to a person who picked up a ring and ran with it. But as part of the DC wrapping up a lot of this Green Lantern mythos with Hal Jordan, they really just like remove the Star Sapphire element of Carol Ferris and just kind of return her to her normal human form. Now, of course, what she's really talking about here is the idea that Ferris Air Force Base is really kind of defunct here. That, uh, you know, it's really kind of Jeff John sitting down and saying, okay, hey guys, you know, here is Carol Ferris's, you know, her stomping grounds, Ferris Air Force Base. Now, again, the cool thing about this is that Jeff Johns is going to run over a lot of this stuff, which is going to make it easy for us. But like any great story, uh, especially a story written by Jeff Johns, it's really just kind of like, hey guys, here are the, here's here's the bricks that we're going to be using to build this house. Here's the brick, here's the mortar, here are the auger we're going to use to tear a hole in the ground. Here's the bush hog that we're going to use to tear up all the grass. You know, here's like, here's all the tools that we need to build this great, big, huge, massive house. And it comes together really well. Now, at this point, we jump to the Bronx, New York City, and we pick up with John Stewart and Guy Gardner. Now, Guy Gardner, I want to talk about for a second, because when it comes to his character, there are two kinds of people. There are the people who don't like Guy Gardner, and there are the fans who are militant about Guy Gardner. Woe betide the poor soul who runs up on a Guy Gardner fan and is like, hey man, Guy Gardner sucks. Like those fans will freak. <laughs> They'll lose their minds, but rightfully so. Historically, in terms of how he's been depicted, this is why I kind of wanted to wait to get into the history of this. Uh, historically, in terms of how he's been depicted, Guy Gardner is a direct reflection of DC's desire to kind of revamp and change up a lot of the Green Lantern mythos. The reason for this is because back in the day, back in the you know, 1950s when Hal Jordan first showed up, he was it was cool. He was super huge. It was a great big deal because the, the only Green Lantern we had before him was Alan Scott and his powers were tied to mysticism. They weren't tied to like, you know, rings that were created by the Guardians of the Universe. Uh, Hal Jordan was a reflection of DC's desire to tap into the sci-fi element of comic books that had made sci-fi comics so popular, roll those over into DC and then reinvigorate superheroes in comics. Barry Allen was the first step that was taken to do that. Barry Allen, uh, the reason why he's so important is because he literally reinvigorated interest in comic book superheroes. If Julius Schwartz had not created Barry Allen and introduced him in DC Showcase number four, I think it was, uh, I doubt that we would have the kind of second renaissance of superheroes that we had in the 1950s. But with, with Hal Jordan showing up, it was like spacefaring adventures and it was really cool. The problem with this was that by the mid 19, by I guess really by the late 1950s, this guy Moore Weisinger had taken over the role of Superman and he was like, well, let's just have Superman go into space. Well, now, you know, fans were kind of conflicted because on one hand you had Hal Jordan who was kind of cool, but he was nothing when it came to the strength of the power of Superman. And then you had Superman in space. And so why would you 
read stories about Hal Jordan in space when you can read stories about Superman in space. And so Hal Jordan's comics began to fell to, you know, fall to the wayside and began to sort of disappear. Now, there was a point where DC rolled him over alongside uh, Green Arrow. We'll talk a little bit more about that here in a minute once we get to Oliver Queen. Um, but, you know, because of the fact that Hal Jordan's comics really just failed to maintain a reader base of any real uh, of any real substance and number during the, the 50s and 60s, going into 1968, I think it was, uh, DC said, okay, well, let's toy with the idea of getting rid of Hal Jordan and replace him with a new Green Lantern called Guy Gardner. Now, after Guy Gardner was introduced over the years, uh, he was hot-headed, you know, he was uh, he was really impulsive, but that element of his character drew fans in because the question was, you know, what's gonna, it was, it was, it was like a game, you know, what's Guy Gardner going to say or do this time? You know, especially when we saw Crisis on Infinite Earths coming around and we saw him become one of the founding members of Justice League International, he was constantly butting heads with Batman, you know, because he's like, yeah, Batman, but you're old hat, man. You know, you're old school. What we need is a new school leader. We need a guy that understands the streets, understands how things work, you know, and it was very rare that he would just put up with people's shit to be, you know, to pardon my language, but you know, to, to be quite frank, it was rare that he would put up with people's nonsense. And so because of that, he really grew as a popular character. But again, because of the fact that Hal Jordan just wasn't resonating, because of the fact that the Green Lantern mythos just wasn't sticking, despite the fact that John Stewart was introduced in 1971, by the time we got around to the late 1980s to the mid 1990s, eventually DC was like, you know what, let's just get rid of Hal Jordan in his entirety and let's just kind of like revamp the Green Lantern mythos. Part of this was looking at Guy Gardner and saying, okay, let's take him away from being a Green Lantern. So we effectively lost his connection to the Lantern Corps. Uh, he became a Yellow Lantern for a while. And then we saw a story where he basically, uh, they, they kind of went back and they touched and said, well, he's, you know, he's part of some alien race. I don't remember what it's called. It starts with a V. Um, but they said, you know, he basically has like minor shape shifting. He can grow to a certain size. He could kind of, you know, change his, his body's physical structure to allow for new powers and abilities. And he started calling himself Warrior. And that's where he stayed. He never really moved beyond that because, you know, by that point in time, you had Jon Stewart, who was, you know, a major Green Lantern because of the fact that fans were coming from the Justice League cartoon show and they wanted to see Jon Stewart as a Green Lantern. You had Kyle Rayner, who had already been introduced. And again, we'll get to him a little bit, you know, here in a second, once we, once we get to the return of, uh, of Hal Jordan. But it was really just this idea that, um, you know, Guy Gardner was just kind of left out in no man's land for a time. And he basically just sort of stayed there. And so DC never really did a whole lot with his character. Now, again, with the, with the two of them, with Guy Gardner and Jon Stewart kind of going at it with one another, one of the things that I hope you notice here is the huge difference between the two. Guy Gardner's impulsive. He's reckless. He's hot-headed. Jon Stewart's very composed. Jon Stewart's very calm. Now, his own experiences have led to that. His own experiences have led to him uh, being composed, you know, always looking to the future, always wanting to make sure that he makes the right decision, sometimes overthinking the decisions that he makes. But, you know, they're like oil and vinegar, but they also work so well together. The kicker about this is Jon Stewart also recognizes that when it comes down to it, when all else fails, if there's any guy that you want in your corner, it's Guy Gardner because he's got it where it counts. When it comes down to it, when it's like, look, Guy, we got to stop screwing around. We, we got to get down to serious business. He will be in your corner and he'll he'll fight to the to the bitter end. And that's one of the reasons why fans love him so much. But, uh, you know, continuing on, we basically pick up with the arrival of, of Hal Jordan. Now, something to point out here is this is Hal Jordan's specter. And this is really when we start to get into a lot of the uh, of the interesting things about this, because when he arrives and he starts talking to Jon Stewart and, and Guy Gardner, immediately people start descending on him, spilling their deepest secrets. You know, people that cheated on their taxes. You know, Guy Gardner's like, hey, I cheated on my taxes. People are saying that basically, you know, had affairs. I mean, they're really just spilling their deepest, darkest secrets. And Hal Jordan effectively has to bail out. Now, uh, we'll find out why here in a minute. But at this point, we jump over to Oliver Queen. Now, Oliver Queen is actually spending time with a girl named Mia. And Mia was kind of like this newest iteration of Speedy by the time this era of comics came around, or at least she was. When, when she had first popped up. Mia was a girl who had a, actually had a pretty dark past. Um, she was more or less kind of cast out onto the street. Uh, she was eventually forced into child prostitution. And then when she was discovered by Oliver Queen, he basically just kind of like took her, you know, under his ward in the same way that Batman took, you know, Dick Grayson and Jason Todd after him, you know, brought them in under uh, under his care and taught her everything he knows. So she can be a contributing member of society. The problem with all this is that, you know, while they're doing whatever it is they do when it's their training and exercises and so on and so forth, um, they're basically ambushed by by Black Hand. Now, this is a really, really funny situation here because Black Hand was always like a minor villain. I mean, he was never like a like a huge guy. He was never like, oh my God, Black Hand's here. The Justice League Assemble. You know, it was, it was never anything like that. You know, it was like, oh, Black Hand's here, whatever, you know. But what he does is he basically breaks into the home of Oliver Queen and he steals the ring of Hal Jordan. Oliver Queen, of course, intervenes, but then we suddenly have Hal Jordan arriving here as the Spectre. Now, this is why I waited to bring this up because uh, for a lot of people who are getting into Jeff Johns Green Lantern
Washington Rebirth. The question is, how does the specter fit into this? You know, how do we get from point A to point B? What's the connection here? Well, the connection here is a story called Emerald Twilight, as well as Zero Hour, and then Final Night. And because of the fact that Hal Jordan just wasn't selling that well in the realm of comics, uh, with Superman basically being killed off, DC said, well, you know what? Let's use this. I mean, if we're going to kill off Superman, then, you know, let's let's get rid of Hal Jordan. Let's use this as a chance to basically have like an unofficial crisis where we begin to sort of get rid of these heroes that we really can't do anything with. The problem was that Hal Jordan was the Green Lantern. I mean, you know, he was the, the most popular of all the Green Lanterns, despite the fact that his comics didn't sell that well. And so because of that, DC couldn't just kill him, kill him. They just basically had to put him on the back burner. And so what they did is they said, okay, during the, during the events, during the fallout of the death of Superman called Reign of the Superman, in addition to Cyborg Superman basically being the main bad guy, we're going to have him pair up with a villain named Mongol. They're going to destroy Coast City. Hal Jordan's going to come back, find out his city and his home and everybody he knows has ever been destroyed. And then he's going to recreate it. The Guardians of the Universe are going to chastise him for it. And then in his grief, he's basically going to lash out and he's going to destroy all the Green Lanterns and he's going to kill all the Guardians of the Universe. Now, during that time, he basically started calling himself Parallax because back during the events of Emerald Twilight, Parallax prior to Jeff John's run was just a name that Hal Jordan gave himself. You know, it was just, I'm calling myself Parallax now. And it was kind of cool at the time because it seemed pretty edgy, but he essentially just kind of destroyed his Green Lantern ring, was like, you know, I have absolute power now. I don't need to be a Green Lantern. I'm better than all of them. Took on this, this immense amount of energy. And in doing so, Gantlet reassembled his ring and he gave it to Kyle Rayner. And that's where Kyle Rayner came in as the next Green Lantern. So again, it was really kind of DC setting the stage and saying, okay, let's go ahead and do this soft reboot. Now, uh, following Emerald Twilight, DC also sat down and said, okay, we have a lot of continuity issues after Crisis on Infinite Earths, but we only have one universe right now. So let's basically just blink the universe out of existence, bring it back. And after the universe comes back, we'll give the fans a chronological timeline of when events took place. You know, we'll have some of these continuity issues fixed, different things like that. That was called Zero Hour Crisis in Time. But because of the fact that Hal Jordan was still kind of around, he was still kind of there just lingering in the background, DC was looking at the sales of Green Lantern under Kyle Rayner, and they were looking at the former sales of Green Lantern under Hal Jordan. They said, which one is more popular? Well, at the time, Kyle Rayner was creating constructs that people had never seen in a Hal Jordan comic before. You know, Kyle Rayner was creating these giant robots and these really intricate things because the backstory of his character was that he was an artist. He wasn't just some Air Force pilot who was relatively unimaginative. And so because of that, his comic sold, uh, outsold Hal Jordan's by leaps and bounds. And so DC said, okay, fine, time for Hal Jordan to go. And so they launched a story called Final Night where Hal Jordan basically just sacrificed his life to reignite the sun. And that was it. He, you know, that, that was the end of Hal Jordan. We never really saw or heard from him again. Following this, DC basically merged him with a being called the Spectre. And then they said, okay, let's go ahead and start bringing him back. Now there was a little bit of time, you know, while this happened, but as the Spectre, he just kind of appeared, you know, occasionally as the judgment of God. And he would carry out these things. Again, DC just kind of keeping him on the back burner. And so that's why he appears here as the Spectre, because he's basically possessed by the spirit of God's judgment. And all he really does is just go around and impose God's judgment on people proportional to what their acts are. Of course, what he says here with Black Hand is, you know, you, you're essentially a thief. And because of that, we're going to burn away the one thing that you value most. We're taking your hand. And so it, he literally just turns his hand to, to ash, turns it to coal, you know, and, and burns it away. And so, you know, again, with Oliver Queen, uh, because of the fact that Oliver Queen and, and um, Hal Jordan had shared a publication together, they had a lot of crossover. They had a lot of, you know, uh, events that, that happened between the two of them, especially with things like Snowbirds Don't Fly, where it was revealed that Roy Harper was addicted to heroin. Because of that, um, you know, the two of them have a lot of history together. And so really, if anybody knows uh, Hal Jordan the best here, it's probably, you know, Oliver Queen. And he's going to be a pretty important character here. But more so than him, I think it's really going to be Kyle Rayner as the most important. But, you know, while uh, John Stewart and, and Guy Gardner are spending time at Guy Gardner's bar called The Warriors, it was really kind of this cool hangout similar to like nowhere from uh, from DC or from Marvel Comics, except it was stationed on Earth. You know, his, his powers basically kind of begin to go awry. His powers begin to go insane to the point that he doesn't really seem to be able to control them. Let's off a massive amount of energy and what seems to be an explosion. Now, following this, we basically pick up with, you know, just some pilot flying across or, you know, flying over Coast City. When he comes to the realization that Coast City has effectively been recreated, it's been reformed again. Now, it's not teeming with life. It's not like everybody's there, but the buildings, the streetlights, you know, a lot of the things that people recognize are there. And so because of this, the question is what's going on, what's happening. Now, jumping back to Guy Gardner, um, you know, in the Justice League of America Watchtower, he's, you know, being being held by, you know, Dr. Midnight, by, by John Jones, you know, Superman, Batman. I mean, they're all there trying to figure out what's going on. And what they do is they come to the realization that his body just kind of seems to be restructuring itself. You know, his body seems to be, you know, reforming. Uh, for whatever reason, the alien DNA that was so prevalent there is fighting against its human DNA. Now, in truth, this is 
is uh, this is Jeff Johns basically you know doing this thing where his body is effectively being purified. So he's going back to just human uh, you know human Guy Gardner and setting the stage for him to return you know to being a Green Lantern. But more so than that, uh, we pick up with with the Flash meeting with Aquaman. Now the crazy thing about this is keep in mind this is not Barry Allen. This is Wally West Flash. And you know as they're going through uh, Coast City, what we find out is that one of the buildings that or I guess the building that's currently uh, constructed here is a building where the address is 22 C View. The reason why this matters is because this was the home of, of Hal Jordan's old apartment. And so the, the inclination that's being sent off to Batman, at least what he's picking up in terms of, of what's going on in Coast City, is that for whatever reason, Hal Jordan is going through and just restructuring old points of his life, which basically tell everybody that Hal Jordan's coming back. Now, the reason why this is a huge deal is because remember, the last time the Justice League saw Hal Jordan, he was trying to kill them all as, you know, as Parallax. He was trying to wipe them all out. And so it's like, oh my God, you know, if Hal Jordan is coming back, I mean, it's Parallax is coming back, it means he's probably going to try to wipe out the universe again, or at the very least, they simply just don't trust him, or at least Batman doesn't trust him. Now, switching focus here, Jeff Johns puts a lot of emphasis on, um, on Jon Stewart. Jon Stewart is, is a guy whose loyalty is of the extreme in the sense that once Jon Stewart believes that you're a, per, a person worth standing up for, uh, he'll stand up for you no matter what goes on. And this is what he does with Batman. You know, Batman is like, we can't trust Hal Jordan. He's bad mouthing him left and right. Jon Stewart steps up and says, enough is enough. You know, like you're going to have respect for Hal Jordan. The reason why is because as Batman, he exists based on fear. In order for anybody to believe that he's legitimate, they have to be afraid of him. But Hal Jordan as a Green Lantern, his entire entire purpose is to fight fear. And so if he's resistant to the fear that Batman puts off, or at least to the persona that Batman throws off, then in the eyes of Hal Jordan, Batman is just a billionaire who's still sad that his parents died. That's all Bruce Wayne is to Hal Jordan. I mean, Hal Jordan still respected him to a degree, but in, you know, when it comes down to hero versus hero, what the, what each one stands for, you know, Jon Stewart sees through Batman's guys, Hal Jordan saw through Batman's guys, you know, anybody who had to fight willpower for it, literally just to maintain their abilities, saw right through Batman's guys. He was just a guy who was super smart, dressed up as a bat and had to face off against a crazy guy who dresses the Joker every once in a while. So again, you know, with, with this with this little bit, what we end up doing is we basically pick up with, with Hal Jordan coming across Carol Ferris. Now, this is just a quick little thing, you know, where he basically reintroduces himself to her. It's really just kind of, you know, again, Jeff Johns setting the stage and saying, hey, some bigger things are going to be coming. But Jeff Johns also sits down and says, hey guys, there's a lot of history here. So he really just kind of runs over the history between the two. Now, initially, you know, when Hal Jordan talks to her, he says, hey, tell me about the time that we first met. And she says, well, you know, it was when you were a pilot and you were working at my dad's office, you know, and you know, you hit on me when everybody else was afraid of me and that kind of thing. But no, Hal Jordan says, think back further, you know, the time that we really first met. And this is again, you know, really Jeff John saying, hey, you know, in the youth of Hal Jordan, he first met Carol Ferris when Carol's father was running an Air Force base, told Hal Jordan's father to continue piloting a uh, a, a jet that was experiencing, you know, some, some technical issues. And then the jet exploded and Hal Jordan's father died. Now, what Jeff Johns is actually going to do later on is write a story called Green Lantern Secret Origins. And that's really going to kind of come back for a lot of stuff for Hal Jordan and, and sort of reinvigorate that and, and bring things back up again. But uh, again, this really gives us a lot of cool insight in terms of Hal Jordan, you know, with regards to how he views the world, you know, in saying that uh, for him, his father was always, you know, a major focal point of his life. Uh, and he always wanted to, to basically make his father proud, you know, but for him, uh, because of everything that had happened, you know, when he became Parallax and after he became the Spectre, his idea is he needs to find a way back. Now, Hal Jordan is being very, very, you know, cloak and dagger here. He's being very mysterious in a lot of different ways. And in fact, you know, we'll find out why here in a little bit because we'll learn this is not actually Hal Jordan in the traditional sense. Instead, uh, we essentially have Zatanna of the Justice League, you know, telling telling everybody, hey, here is where Hal Jordan is located at. Now, the other half of this is we also have Alan Scott. This is really kind of cool because Jeff John sits down and says, hey guys, remember, Alan Scott is not a traditional Green Lantern like Jon Stewart, Guy Gardner, or Hal Jordan. Instead, his powers are tied to mysticism. They're not tied to rings created by the Guardians of the Universe. And so because of this, I wouldn't say he's not as powerful so much as he's just like, you know, he's an orange compared to a banana. And so because of this, you know, he says, look, what's going on here is something that I can't necessarily cope with because I don't fully understand, you know, it is, you know, how their rings work. All I really understand is my ring is based in, in mysticism and that kind of thing. And so again, you know, because of the fact that Zatanna, you know, DC's uh, major, you know, mystical character, one of the, one of their major mystical characters locates Hal Jordan. It's basically the entire Justice League showing up and responding to it. Now, you know, initially the, the Justice League starts to question him to a degree. And we, of course, have Hal Jordan, you know, kind of converting to the specter. And we learn that there is this huge inner argument this huge 
huge uh, fight for the soul of Hal Jordan going on inside his own physical body, you know, fighting for his soul. More so than that, uh, we basically have, you know, the, the body of Guy Gardner continuing to fight itself to the point that the human aspect of it wins on. And so what is up happening here is the ring of, uh, of, of Hal Jordan basically splits. It duplicates itself and then it latches on to Guy Gardner and we officially have Guy Gardner coming back as a Green Lantern. And so again, this is Jeff John saying, hey guys, Guy Gardner's back to being a Green Lantern again. That whole warrior thing, gone. Like he is a Green Lantern in the traditional sense as you guys have all come to know him. The other half of this is, again, we have Jeff Johns coming along and saying, hey, there's a lot more to this picture here. That's why I say this this run is insane because there's so much that goes on. But we have, you know, basically Kilowog showing up here uh, as part of the Green Lantern Corps, meeting with Kyle Rayner after he had uh, after he had fallen to Earth. And But we also have Gantlet appearing here. And we essentially learned that Kyle Rayner coming to Earth and leaving the sun was designed to, you know, for him to be in possession of the coffin of Hal Jordan, that when he had gone into the sun, when he had sacrificed his life, that his body had remained in stasis. But but the the version that we're basically seeing running around right now that's the that's the spirit that's that's really kind of like the the spiritual manifestation of Hal Jordan in terms of how he relates to the specter more so than that we're actually going to get a lot of backstory here in terms of you know parallax of how all that stuff comes into the equation now this is why i say things are kind of cool and things run kind of crazy because you know in the in the mind of Hal Jordan not only is he you know does he have uh, the specter latched onto his body but again he's also fighting against the spiritual entity of parallax because the parallax you know, persona as it initially appears here is still very much a part of who he is. And he's constantly fighting against this darker side of himself. But again, Jeff Johns is actually coming back or what at least what he does is he comes back and he changes a lot of this because we have Kyle Rayner meeting with Oliver Queen. And Oliver Queen says, okay, look, if, if that's the physical body of Hal Jordan there, then who is the Hal Jordan that's, you know, out there right now dealing with the Justice League? And what Kyle Rayner does is he basically, you know, he's, he's a vector for Jeff Johns to retcon a lot of the history when it came to, you know, yellow and and the green lantern mythos and what i mean here is that for for decades and decades green lanterns were you know their, their rings were weak to the color yellow and it was just a yellow impurity that was the only real explanation that was given it's the reason why sinestro you know back before you know long before really you know before crisis on infinite earth uh he had created a ring that was yellow because it would it was basically the weakness of the green lanterns it's not any one thing in particular it's just the green lanterns couldn't really cope against him and so because of this uh what jeff johns does is he comes back and says no no no, no Parallax is an actual entity. Parallax is an actual being that at the beginning of time, there was this, this sentient organism, you know, that basically fed on the fear of all living things. Now, because of the fact that the guardians of the universe had become aware of this parallax entity was wreaking havoc across the universe, they in turn forged the central power battery. And it's one of the reasons why they created the Green Lanterns, just because of the fact that, you know, the Green Lanterns powered, uh, powered by willpower would be able to combat all fear that existed in the universe. But because of the fact that parallax was inherently fear himself and because willpower fights against fear but because as long as there are people in the universe there will be fear it's, it was basically impossible to destroy parallax in the traditional sense and so what the guardians of the universe did is they basically locked him inside the central power battery and kept him confined there which they in turn used to go on and create the green lantern core and what jeff john says is this is the reason why green lanterns were weak to the color yellow not because it's just some enigmatic yellow impurity out there somewhere but because much like dropping you know ink in a bottle of water, uh, all it's going to do is just kind of eventually move itself out to the point that it basically, you know, it spreads all throughout every ounce of water in that bottle. The Green Lanterns were basically infected by Parallax. Not only that, uh, Hal Jordan was the greatest of the Green Lanterns, you know, and like a cold coming on over the course of three days, Parallax just kind of began to seep his way, you know, seep its way into Hal Jordan and, you know, every time he used the ring. And so because of this, Hal Jordan was quite literally being poisoned by the Parallax entity that was slowly possessing him to the point that when Emerald Twilight happened, it was the perfect opportunity for Parallax to seize absolute control. And so when that happened, that's when Hal Jordan became Parallax. So, you know, what Jeff Johns is saying here is that instead of Emerald Twilight simply saying that Hal Jordan just declared himself Parallax, instead, Hal Jordan was actually possessed by the Parallax entity. Now, in terms of how it was the Parallax entity was able to escape, you know, with Hal Jordan going in and destroying the uh, central power battery, it was kind of enigmatic. People were like, well, how did he get out? You know, how did this happen? And so what we end up learning here is that 
the uh, the escape of parallax was not arbitrary. The escape of parallax was not accidental. The escape of parallax was actually engineered by Sinestro himself. And so what this does is this again allows Sinestro to be introduced as part of Jeff John's Green Lantern rebirth. And he's really just kind of grabbing all these different themes and dragging all these different themes in together. Now, with regards to Sinestro going against uh, Oliver Queen and, and Kyle Rayner here, to be quite honest, I wouldn't go as far as to say that either one of these guys stand a chance. And in fact, Oliver Queen, we know wouldn't. And, and Kyle Rayner even says, hey, look, I'm not really sure I'm ready for this. He can defend, but Kyle Rayner is pretty exhausted and pretty weakened at the moment. And so the idea of him fending off against one of the greatest Green Lanterns to have ever existed that's now turned evil uh, really seems a lot like a fool's errand. And so again, you know, it, it's really just an instance of, of Sinestro kind of toying with Oliver Queen, toying with Kyle Rayner as he's going through with the intention of eventually taking the body of Hal Jordan with him. Now, on the other side of this, we still have Hal Jordan battling this entity of Parallax, trying to find a way to win out his own soul. But again, we, we also have uh, Guy Gardner, we have John Stewart coming into the fray in an attempt to try to free him. Now, the, the other part of this is that because of the fact that the Parallax entity was basically free running, it was just kind of running around, it had seized control of John Stewart. It had seized control of Guy Gardner for a time, but eventually they were able to, you know, to break free. And so in response to this, because of the fact that there are uh, so many superheroes out there who are afraid of the return of Parallax, we basically have all hands on deck here. I mean, we have Dr. Fate, you know, we have Superman, Wonder Woman, Zatanna, Supergirl, uh, Robin, we have Superboy, Cyborg, everybody who can fight is here. Because in truth, if Parallax is coming back, it would take the combined effort of all of them to really hold off. And so it's really just kind of two different battles happening in two locations. We have Sinestro going against Kyle Rayner and Green Arrow, and we have the entirety of the Justice League going against what they believe to be Parallax Reborn in the form of Hal Jordan. Now, the cool thing about this is that the, the rings run on willpower, but it's not an easy thing. And that's what Jeff Johns establishes here. You, you know, you can't just pick up a ring and say, I have willpower, and then suddenly become a Green Lantern. It's a mentally exhausting feat. This is proven when Oliver Queen, you know, is able to use the ring for an instant and summon an arrow and, you know, and shoot it at, at, at Sinestro. But that's it. Now, of course, Kyle Rayner basically grabs him and they, they just kind of race off just for the very preservation of their lives. But Oliver asked the question, you know, is it that mentally exhausting every single time you use the ring? And Kyle says, yes, every single time. Like, it takes practice, but it is a mentally exhausting thing to maintain such willpower, you know, especially when you're going against overwhelming odds. Now, again, you know, what we get here with, you know, switching back to Hal Jordan, you know, what Jeff Johns gives us here is this really cool situation where it's just this inner battle between Hal Jordan, the Spectre, and, and Parallax. Not only that, we actually find out that the Spectre bonding itself to Hal Jordan was for a purpose. The Parallax is a wildly powerful entity that could quite literally lay waste to the universe. The Spectre bonding with Hal Jordan was for the purpose of giving Hal Jordan a fighting chance to fight off Parallax. It was giving him power that he wouldn't normally have under his own circumstances. Now, of course, we also have Ganthlet, you know, of the Guardians of the Universe making an appearance here, coming back basically to try to fight off, you know, try to help defend against Parallax, but it was really just kind of Jeff John saying, hey, look, this is why Hal Jordan became the Spectre. It wasn't arbitrary, you know, it wasn't some plot device. It was an effort to literally keep him alive. And so where Hal Jordan's able to fight off the Parallax entity and uh, and the Spectre basically just kind of like bails off to go fulfill its role as a judge of God because of the fact that it essentially helped Hal Jordan achieve his goal of getting rid of the Parallax entity from within his own soul. Parallax basically merges with Gantlet under the idea that Gantlet had made the case that the Spectre's power is almost non-existent in comparison to his own. And so because of this, Hal Jordan is actually, you know, offered the afterlife. You know, he's really kind of greeted with the afterlife, the possibility of leaving. And in fact, Ganthlet really kind of entices him with this. You know, he's really kind of like, you know, follow my voice. Yes, you know, get to the, go to the afterlife. And Hal Jordan does that. But the reason is not so that he'll die. The reason is that so his spirit will effectively be cleansed. Because what Hal Jordan needs to know is that as a superhero, as a Green Lantern, he did all the right things. That the Parallax entity possessing him was not his fault. He was literally just a guy in mourning, you know, and, and in this mourning, in this experience that he had, he was in a position where he was easy to be taken advantage of, and that's exactly what Parallax did. And so as he's kind of transitioning this afterlife experience, he talks with Abin Sur, he talks with his father, he talks with these extremely important people that played pivotal roles in his life, and when he emerges, he basically comes out as the Green Lantern. Of course, Oliver Queen is wearing the ring, trying to use it as best he can, but the ring whisks off of him, and when it does, it goes racing to Hal Jordan's physical body, and his spirit basically merges with his body. It's, it's finally how Jordan returned back to who he was before. And this is Jeff John saying, now we're off to the races. Hal Jordan is back. 
let's go. Like, let's let's do this. And it's so cool because we get this Hal Jordan versus Sinestro. It's not a battle for the ages, but it's a great way to have this story go because the two have been enemies for so long. And it's really Hal Jordan saying, look, Sinestro, you know what I mean? I realize how capable you are. I realize how powerful you are, but I'm fighting for something greater. I'm fighting for friends. I'm fighting for family. I'm fighting for those that I love. You know, not only that, it's really just, you know, kind of Hal Jordan giving us this, this speech, you know, giving this, this beautiful inner monologue, you know, where he's saying things like it's good to have this ring back again it feels like i'm back to who i was it feels like i am myself again it's like waking up out of a dream and so ultimately you know as he's going against sinestro uh, he's actually successful you know uh, you know with with help from kyle rayner uh in defeating sinestro and so the idea was that uh, at least to kyle rayner anyway the idea seemed to be that sinestro was basically destroyed of course we find out that was not the case that sinestro was essentially sent back to the antimatter universe sent back to cord uh, and that was really kind of the end of the road for him at least for the time being anyway it's jeff johns basically saying he's going to come back later on. But this is also the first time that we get to see Kyle Rayner and Hal Jordan meet in the traditional sense, where Kyle Rayner, the Green Lantern, meets Hal Jordan, the iconic Green Lantern. Now, the funny thing about this is that, again, Kyle Rayner is a great Green Lantern, but he's new. He's the new guy. He doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have the wisdom. And in a lot of ways, he doesn't have the confidence that Hal Jordan had. And so when he sits down, you know, he says, look, I don't know if I'm, if I'm capable of this. You know, I don't know if I'm the kind of person that can really be an effective Green Lantern. I don't know if I'm a person that has what it takes to overcome great fear. And this is why Hal Jordan is probably the best of the Green Lanterns, not because of his fighting, not because of, you know, his ability to create solid constructs or go against great enemies. It's his ability to inspire people to follow him because what he tells Kyle Rayner is you flew from one side of the universe to the other. You fought Sinestro one-on-one -on -one and lived to talk about it. What do you think you've been doing? Like, I mean, you've basically been staring death in the face and you've been fighting. If anybody here has been overcoming their fear, it's you. All you have to do is realize you've been overcoming your fear. And it inspires Kyle Rayner. And he's like, let's go. And so he takes off, you know, with, with Hal Jordan. And they basically race off to, to you know, fight this uh, this guardian of the, or fight Ganthlet, you know, possessed by Parallax. And again, uh, th that really seemed to be what Ganthlet was shooting for was, we need to find a way to unite the Green Lanterns together, or at least what's left of the core. You know, we have to unite Kilowog. We have to unite Guy Gardner, Kyle Rayner, Jon Stewart, Hal Jordan. Bring them all together and have them face off against the Parallax entity. And that's exactly what they do. Now, initially, the Justice League tries to jump in. The Justice League tries to step in and say, hey, we got to do something. You know, we got to become involved in this in some form or fashion. And, uh, you know, of course, Alan Scott says something says, no, you are not going to have a hand in this. And the reason why is because this is a Green Lantern affair. This is one of the first times that all these guys are fighting together since, or really the first time since Hal Jordan came back. Hal Jordan needs to remember what it means to be a Green Lantern. He needs to remember what he's capable of. And so because of this, you know, he alongside Kilowog and, and John Stewart and Guy Gardner, you know, it's really just kind of John, uh, Jeff John saying, hey guys, here is where things are now. Here is the Green Lantern mythos going forward. And they face off against, against Parallax and they effectively banish the entity, you know, temporarily. Of course, it's not, not a permanent thing because, you know, it seems almost impossible to completely kill him. Instead, they effectively just kind of banish him back to the central battery core, and that's really it. You know, he's really confined to where he was before. Yes, it does return the yellow impurity for a time. It's, it's Hal Jordan showing uh, Batman, Superman, the rest of the Justice League that, yes, he's back, but he's not Parallax. He's here to be a hero. He's here to be a good guy. And so again, this is really just kind of Jeff Johns uh, setting the stage and saying, hey, guys, here's where things are going to go from this point going forward. Oh my God, Rob Core. <laughs> I'm running, I have no, I've had no sleep. I'm running on zero hours of sleep right now. And it's not like it's one of those things where it's like, oh God, I gotta, I got no sleep because I gotta make videos. And it's just like, oh God, I'm going through this depressive phase. No, not at all. I'm running on zero hours of sleep because I'm reading Jeff John's Green Lantern. <laughs> and it's, it's the craziest thing. It's, dude, this, this is so addictive because like, I guess like the origin of the Star Sapphires, right? And I'm like, well, I mean, I can read just like a little bit more, right? Like I can read just like a little bit more and then I'll go to bed. And the next thing I know, I'm halfway through the first volume of Sinestro Core War and it's just like why have I not slept yet like but it's it's so good it's 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 such an amazing run but here's the deal so with Jeff John's Green Lantern and I actually noticed this question was being asked uh, by a few people when I had posted the reading order on Reddit and I actually have the reading order for all the videos that we're going to do I'll have the reading order down in the description um or at least the, the order of the videos as we're going to do them down in the description but one of the things that I saw is a lot of people were saying hey like when you're listening to things like Green Lantern Core did Jeff John's write that no Jeff John's just wrote Green Lantern 
but Green Lantern Corps is a companion comic, and in truth, while it's not necessary, it definitely helps. For those of you guys who are coming from Marvel Comics who read Hickman's Avengers and New Avengers, Green Lantern and Green Lantern Corps is exactly like that. If you were reading, you know, everything in Marvel Comics about the collapse of the multiverse, and all you cared about was the collapse of the multiverse, all you cared about was planets crashing into each other and that kind of thing, then you were reading New Avengers. You were following the Illuminati. You were following, you know, Reed Richards and, and Doctor Strange and, you know, so on and so forth. But if all you cared about is what the superheroes were doing while the multiverse was collapsing, then you were reading Avengers. But both stories together made things more cohesive. It made things a lot more intriguing, a lot more interesting, and it was it was richer and it was a fuller story. Now, eventually there came a point where, you know, Avengers and New Avengers just intertwined and you had to read them both in order to understand what was going on. Otherwise, you would have gotten just pieces of the story here and there and things wouldn't have made any sense. But with Green Lantern, it's similar to that, but only in so far that, that the stories never really intertwine directly. They do when it comes to events, but they're really still kind of isolated to a degree, but we're actually going to cover all of them. We're going to cover both Green Lantern and Green Lantern Core. Uh, but what we're going to do here is we're going to pick up with Secret Origin. Now, chronologically, Secret Origin is not uh, the way we're doing it here. This is actually out of order. Secret Origin comes much later on in Jeff John's Green Lantern, but I really want to cover it now. The reason why is because what it does is it teases things. Atrocitus, the black, uh, the, the Blackest Night Prophecy. It teases these little things, and then we won't see or hear anything about them until we get to like Sinestro Core War, until we get to like the prelude to Sinestro Core War, and until we get to Blackest Night. We just get these great little, these great little moments here. And I think, I really think it makes things more cohesive, to be honest with you guys. I think that, that reading Secret Origin before you even start the main Jeff Johns Green Lantern run, uh, I think makes things a little more interesting. So again, the cool thing about what Jeff Johns did here is, is under normal circumstances, whenever a writer takes over a story, they take over a character, they adjust things. They kind of, you know, say, hey, here's where things stand right now. But then if you want to know about why certain events are taking place, well, they just tell you, go back and read the old stuff. Jeff Johns does not do that. We can literally start here and not know anything about Green Lantern before Jeff Johns took it over. That's how self-contained it is, and that's how well-written it is. And so we're basically going to take that approach. There'll be a few times where we reference things from before Jeff Johns, but on the whole, we're not really going to. We're actually just going to kind of treat it as though this is the first time Green Lantern has ever appeared in DC Comics. Now, of course, what this does is this picks up on the early days of Hal Jordan. That's to say when he was a kid. And of course, his first introduction to uh, to Carol Ferris. Keep in mind, you know, Carol Ferris' father run a, uh, ran an aircraft testing program, which basically existed to test out different aircraft for military use. That was the basis behind it. Of course, you had Air Force pilots, different things like that. Former Air Force pilots in a lot of ways. But when a new ship was, or I'm sorry, a new plane was created, a new jet was created or something like that, Ferris Air would have their pilots test it out before the military would actually adopt it. And that actually just kind of makes good sense to be honest if a plane was dangerous you wouldn't want to kill your own air force men because of that you'd want to kill somebody else's so <laughs> it sounds messed up it sounds kind of it sounds kind of rough but that's exactly what happens with Hal Jordan's father of course you know the, the kind of classic story here that Hal Jordan's father is killed in a craft that's being developed now this is going to be a major focus point for his character Hal Jordan is going to begin to hate Carl Ferris because of this in the mind of Hal Jordan the way his character is going to grow up the way he's going to progress his life is going to be intertwined with the military but this creates a lot of problems for him because, you know, again, with his mother having to sit down and reconcile the fact that her husband is dead uh, because of the fact that he flew a plane that was being experimented on, she's terrified that her children will go the same way. You know, and, and that's what's really cool about this. Jeff Johns is feeding on a lot of existing concepts, a lot of existing ideas. For example, the wife of a uh, of a police officer, you know, or the husband of a police officer that loses their significant other in the line of duty will tell their children, do not become a cop because they don't want their kids to be follow the same fate because in their mind, and something switches, something changes. You know, where previously they were like, yes, you know, being a being an officer is, is an honor or something along those lines. You know, now it's, well, all it's going to do is get you killed. And they don't want to lose any more of their family in the process. So that's what's so great about this is because while Jeff Johns has Hal Jordan's father dying, you know, of a, of a plane accident, you could change that scenario out to anything, a firefighter, you know, a U.S. soldier. You could change it for any number of things. And that terrifying element is still there. Now, of course, what this has done is create a rift within the family, not just with regards to, to Hal Jordan's mom, but with regards to Hal Jordan himself in the sense that he wants to be an Air Force pilot. He wants to follow his father's footsteps. His older brother, you know, kind of looks at him and says, look, you're really not honoring what it is that our mother is asking for. You know, his older brother, Jack, really shares what seems to be uh, the kind of struggle that his mother goes through. And he really seems to be the guy who's kind of stepping into the role of being the supportive member of the family. Because keep in mind, Hal Jordan's mom is going through mental gymnastics right now. But at the same time, Hal Jordan's younger brother, Jim, very much plays or has really adopted the safe role 
role of his mom, you know, where he's like, well, mom says you shouldn't do this, so don't do that. You know, mom says you shouldn't do that, so don't do that. And this will actually be a huge part of Jim's life. But for Hal Jordan, all he wants to do is be a pilot. And this comes to fruition, you know, when his younger brother Jim goes to take Hal Jordan a present on his 18th birthday, Hal Jordan's not there, only for us to find out that Hal Jordan has taken off to join the U.S. Air Force. What this does is bring in a guy named General Stone. And General Stone, we'll actually see a lot of him in the first volume of, uh, of Jeff Johns' Green Lantern. And Stone was one of the reasons why I actually decided to do this secret origin before we picked up into the main Green Lantern run in the first place, because I feel like there was a lot of great backstory that was going on there. But General Stone is really just kind of uh, Hal Jordan's head at the moment. He's his superior. You know, he's the one that Hal Jordan's working with and testing these various planes and, and so on and so forth. We also get a little bit of the first encounter between Hal Jordan and Jon Stewart, where they basically both meet each other for the very first time in a military bar, of course they come to blows. Again, it's just really one of these interesting situations where things go back and forth. A lot of this really seems to come to a head though, when Hal Jordan is basically met by the arrival of Jim. Of course, the two of them hadn't seen each other for quite some time, and Jim says, mom is sick. Now, the problem with this for Hal Jordan is, of course, his first gut reaction would be, well, then I need to go see mom. But Hal Jordan's actions of joining the military were in direct opposition to what it is that his mother wanted. And this is where both Jack and Jim come into play. The brothers of Hal Jordan, really Jack more so than Jim, uh, the brothers of Hal Jordan come in and say, look, you know, you're part of the reason why mom is here. Jim not so, not really doesn't take as much of a heavy hand in terms of, you know, Hal Jordan's actions, but Jack definitely says, you're the reason why she's here. You know, Hal Jordan standing in direct opposition to his mom's wishes is really a contributing factor to the fact that she just worried herself with grief all the time. And so Jim even goes as far as to say, look, at the request of Jack, because he basically has power of attorney here, you're not allowed to go see mom. So so long as you're in the Air Force. Now, of course, this leads directly into a confrontation between General Stone and, and Hal Jordan. So for those of you guys who are always curious as to how it was that Hal Jordan was booted out of the Air Force, this is why. What Jordan does is he sits down and says, look, I'm not a quitter. I can't quit. What I need to do is engineer a situation where I get thrown out. Now, in truth, whether you set yourself up to fail or whether you just give up, it's all the same thing because your motivation is to leave. And this is really just kind of uh, kind of Hal Jordan's ego coming into play. And, and even then, you know, Jeff Johns really even draws on that and says, yeah, like it's Hal Jordan. Jordan's ego. That's all it is. You know, Hal Jordan won't allow himself to quit. He'd rather be fired from his job. And so because of that, he literally punches General Stone, you know, due to the fact that Hal Jordan just kind of gone off on a joyride, you know, in a jet and so on and so forth. But of course, this results in him being dishonorably discharged from the Air Force. But as soon as he goes to visit his mother, he's told she died. And this is really where things begin to kind of split. It's almost always in the time of a loved one's passing when things begin to sort of go awry. And the reason why I say that is because usually whenever a loved one becomes ill to the point where death is a possibility, there's a lot of bonding that takes place. There's a lot of setting aside with regards to personal issues, personal problems. Of course, we didn't really see Jack or Jim taking this role. But the idea here is that people usually tend to focus on what's important. The issue with this is that when that individual passes, whether it's by virtue of grief or whether it's by virtue of a, of a belief that there's no need to hold back anymore, people begin just sort of saying things that they wouldn't normally say or letting out feelings that they've been harboring for quite some time and that's the stance that Jack takes you know where Hal Jordan says look I've, I've sacrificed so much I sacrificed the Air Force so on and so forth in order to be here with mom I tried to make it here as I could Jack's response is you've never sacrificed anything all you've ever done is what you wanted to do when mom asked you not to do something you ran off and you did it you know your you know, mom said please don't join the Air Force father you know your father died you know while testing a plane please do not go to the same route as him Hal Jordan took off and did that Jack was the one that left college to get a job in order to make sure the family was taken care of Jack was the one that tried to keep his mother, you know, up on her on her two feet, tried to keep her from just kind of worrying herself into the ground. I mean, ultimately, of course, she had, she had died of cancer. But the idea here is that Hal Jordan's actions are not those of a person who cares about individuals outside of himself. Hal Jordan's actions are of those who only cares about himself. And that's really what, what Jeff Johns is saying here is that in the early days of his life, Hal Jordan was extremely selfish. Now, what this does is this transitions really to the moments or to the days leading up to Hal Jordan becoming a Green Lantern. And it starts out with Ab Sore. Now, of course, Abin Sore is the death of Bruce Wayne's parents to Hal Jordan, which is to say he's the catalyst by which Hal Jordan becomes the Green Lantern. With Abin Sore, his character had always just been seen as a guy who just crash landed on Earth. The reason why that had happened hadn't really changed too much. It was just a battle led him to that location. And the result, or really, was it was like a fight with uh, with Sinestro. But the result was that that incident led to him crash landing on Earth, succumbing to his injuries, but before his death, sending his Green Lantern ring out, which chose Hal Jordan. What Jeff Johns does here is change everything. Jeff Johns comes out with the character of Atrocitus that says that Abin Sore 
had essentially lost his mind over the years, or maybe he gained a little more awareness than he previously had before. The fact remains that Atrocitus had essentially been messing with the mind or really kind of opened Abin Sur up to something he didn't know before. That, you know, prior to the Green Lanterns coming into existence, this dirty little secret, the thing that none of the Green Lanterns knew about was that the Guardians had created the Manhunters. Now, we'll get more into them as we progress further throughout the, the Green Lantern mythos because, you know, the actions of the Manhunters, the role they play is pretty significant, especially when we get to like, uh, you know, really get to Revenge of the Green Lanterns. What is it? War of the Green Lantern? Whichever one it deals uh, deals with the, the lost lanterns that end up making their return. I don't remember what the story's called. And what this does is it shows us that no one really knew about the Manhunters before. More so than that, Atrocitus has been talking about the prophecy of Blackest Night, about how basically someone was going to emerge on Earth that was going to pave the way for the potential death of everything. You know, and it was going to lead to a war of all these different lantern cores. Well, Abensor never knew about this, but the more that Abensor listened to this, the more that Abensor did his own investigations, the more he began to come to the realization that Atrocitus was actually right. Now, keep in mind, Atrocitus is one of the, you know, one of the, the five inversions, you know, one of the remaining inversions of when the Manhunters had gone awry, they'd wreaked havoc through Sector 666, killing virtually everybody in existence. Those who were left formed a group called the Inversions. Now, of course, Atrocitus would go on to form a Red Lantern Corps of his own, but these were in the early days of his character's existence, or I guess his character's turn to the darker side of his nature. And the result is that Abin Sur, you know, in listening to the words of Atrocitus, has grown to become a lot more cautious, that he's basically started to rely on his ring less and less. Now, where one would look at this and say, well, maybe it's some measure of protection, maybe it's some measure of preservation, it's actually fear. Abin Sur is beginning to succumb to fear. And what this is doing is basically weakening the constructs. Now, we'll find out how much this has weakened his constructs later on down the line, but we switch back to Hal Jordan. And switching back to him, what we actually end up doing is, uh, is really, we have him as a person traveling around trying to find work. Of course, being a, an Air Force pilot that was dishonorably discharged from the Air Force does not do him any favors. Somebody else that I hope you notice here, or somebody that I'd like you to notice, is a person by the name of Frank Leminski. Now, we had kind of passed over him a little bit, but Frank Leminski was uh, was a guy uh, who was really just kind of a, he was a, a pilot that was carried away with his success. He believed he was a lot better than he was. He was really kind of a, a reckless pilot, uh, a reckless pilot, a guy who would get carried away with his own skills, so on and so forth, you know, and believe that he was amazing. And we'll see him, you know, later on. But for those of you guys who, who are reading Green Lantern right now, Frank Leminski was the guy who was basically saved by Hal Jordan when he became the Green Lantern uh, later on here in a little while. Frank Leminski became obsessed with the Green Lantern, thought he was going to be one, he never did. And in, in Sam Humphrey's current run of Green Lantern's Rebirth, he became the Phantom Lantern. So that really just kind of shows you how far back Sam Humphreys is drawing when it comes to reaching into the work that Jeff Johns put in when it came to the Green Lantern landscape overall. But again, you know, picking up with uh, with with Hal Jordan trying to find work, uh, the issue here is that he he's basically, you know, found out that one of his, at least the most reliable contact, the person he was hoping for the most, is actually being bought out by uh, by Carol Ferris or by Ferris Air. And so effectively, he, or at least it seems like he's going to be coming under the, the control, or at least under the direction of Carol Ferris. But even then, Hal Jordan's still kind of out of work. He doesn't really have a job per se. But again, switching back to Abin Sur, because of the fact that he's feeling fear, because of the fact that he's falling prey to the idea that his, his lantern ring will fail him somewhere along the line, as the as the prophecy of Atrocitus dictates, uh, this allows Atrocitus a brief moment to basically free himself from the constructs of, uh, of Abin Sur, and in doing so, lead to a fight between Abin Sur and himself that sends Abin, Sh Abin Sur's vessel crashing into the planet Earth. Now, of course, Atrocitus drops a, a jumps out before that happens, but this is why Abin Sur crashed on Earth in the first place. This is why he's basically succumbed to injuries of a mortal nature. This is why he sent his ring out into Earth and says, find me a new host for the Green Lantern of Sector 2814. Find me someone who can undertake this mantle. Hal Jordan is chosen, and Hal Jordan basically becomes Earth's very first Green Lantern. Now, of course, again, this leads into him directly saving the life of Frank Leminski, and this is where Frank Leminski becomes obsessed with the nature of a Green Lantern. Now, the cool thing about this is something that I hope you notice is that within the realm of DC Comics, Frank Leminski is going to be a guy, like if, if you think about, you know, the chronology, if you read Sam Humphrey's Green Lanterns, from the time that he first gets off this plane, the time that he's saved by Hal Jordan, really up until Green Lanterns, he was everything that you saw, that, that, that whole idea of him just, you know, working his body physically, you know, becoming in better health, different things like that, that all took place while all this was happening. You know, he was just in the background. He was just a hidden guy. He was a throwaway character here. And it actually worked out kind of well. But something else to notice is that Hal Jordan is basically learning about what the ring does and how it functions, you know, as he possesses it. And so what he ends up doing is, of course, he meets Hector Hammond for the very first time, you know, really a guy who's brought in as a, as a strategist of sorts for uh, for Ferris Air. But he also basically travels and buries the body of Abin Sur. Now, this is interesting because what this means is that, of course, Hal Jordan recognizes the sacrifice 
sacrifice that Abin Sur made. You know, when he basically said, hey, look, I'm a member of a universal police force. We exist to preserve the or preserve order in the universe, to preserve the safety of all people who reside within. You know, do you accept this honor? How Jordan recognizes the, the kind of responsibility that comes with the role of, uh, of being a Green Lantern, but also values life. Something that I'd like you to keep in the back of your head, though, is this particular instance where he buries the body of Abin Sur. This is how in-depth Jeff Johns goes, because what's going to happen is there's going to be a story called uh, called Hal Jordan Wanted or, or Wanted Hal Jordan, which is actually going to focus on the idea of what happened with Abin Sur and what, you know, the the, the fact that, that Hal Jordan received the power ring of Abin Sur, the whole fallout from, from just this one particular instance. But of course, like all Green Lanterns, like all individuals who were newly inducted into the Lantern Corps, Hal Jordan is basically whisked away to uh to oa in order to receive training now one thing we're going to learn later on down the line really getting into the green lantern core i think it is green getting into a green lantern core recharge is that just because a person is chosen to become a green lantern doesn't mean they have to become a green lantern and in fact this is actually going to be a really really cool scenario that's going to unfold uh, I, I won't spoil anything it's really really cool the way it happens that's one of the things that i that i really really enjoy but right off the bat jeff john shows us that when it comes to hal jordan he's a hothead he does not like being told what to do. <laughs> That's the best way to put it. He has a resistance to authority, I think is the official term that's given. Of course, you know, he meets Kilowog for the very first time. And this is one of the reasons why Kilowog is a fan favorite. I mean, whether people were reading Green Lantern before Jeff Johns took over, whether they jumped into Jeff Johns and it was their first introduction to the Green Lantern mythos and to Kilowog, fans love Kilowog. Poozers. <laughs> Fans love Kilowog just because of the fact that he's got so much personality. But the cool thing about this is that where it would be so easy to write Kilowog off as just like a drill instructor. Like, well, he's just a guy that teaches Green Lanterns how to be Green Lanterns. He's a glorified teacher. The guy's got it where it counts. And that's that's one of the reasons why people love him so much is because he's just such a great guy. And in fact, when Hal Jordan meets him for the first time, they start going at it. You know, it's really not necessarily the idea that, uh, that Hal Jordan is seriously trying to injure Kilowog. It's just that Hal Jordan's like, well, hey, man, like, let's get to it. I mean, if this is boot camp, then let's get to it, man. So they literally start fighting one another, you know, and of course, Kilowog comes out on top here, but it's just kind of cool to see them go back and forth. It's cool to see them, you know, con you know, conflict with one another and battle one another. Now, of course, transitioning back to uh, back to Earth for a quick second, this basically sees like General Stone and different people discovering this ship of Abin Sur and basically taking the ship of Abin Sur. And the reason why I'm covering a lot of this stuff, a lot of the stuff we could run past, a lot of these things we could just kind of jump over. But the reason why I'm covering a lot of this is because when we get into Green Lantern Volume 1, no fear, a lot of these things are going to come back. A lot of these things are going to come to fruition. And so it's important that you guys understand the basis behind a lot of these things so that when they do crop up, you won't feel left out. You won't feel left behind. But again, you know, this also coincides with the fact that Atrocitus has still survived and Atrocitus is making his way out. Now, Atrocitus traveling across the world is in pursuit of a guy named William Hand, also known as Black Hand. And this is why I say things are huge. This, this origin story, it wasn't like, you know, it was Jeff Johns just kind of making things up as he went along. This is why I like doing the origin story story first. I mean, I guess he was making it up as he went along, but I like to read the origin story first because it sets the seeds for everything. Instead of William Hand being somebody who shows up in volume one, you know, long after uh, Hal Jordan was the, was the Green Lantern, really when Hal Jordan first came back to being the Green Lantern after the events of his whole experience with Parallax and Emerald Twilight and so on, that instead the hunt for William Hand, the Black Knight prophecy, predates all of that by quite some time. And so it, it makes things, you know, really interesting and it makes things really, really intriguing. At least I, I, I love this. I love this idea. Like I'm, man, fanboy. <laughs> I love this whole thing. So switching back over to, to Hal Jordan's training, this is when he really begins to learn about the, the yellow impurity for the first time. Now, this is something that I wanted to clear up. This is something that I wanted to rectify right off the bat. Within DC Comics right now at this moment, which is to say the present day, because remember, Secret you know, secret Origins takes place in the past. In the present day right now, we know that the Yellow Impurity was really just the parallax entity inside of this, the, the Green Lantern central power battery. The issue is that at the time, at this point in time, when Hal Jordan's learned to become a Green Lantern, no one knew that. All they knew was that, you know, Green Lanterns are just have a weakness to the color yellow. Now, the reason why they had a weakness to the color yellow was because the parallax entity, the, the very entity of fear, was basically creating a weakness with in the central power battery. It creates a way for the central power battery, or at least for the Green Lanterns, to have a weakness. It's, it's a tainted access to the to willpower. And so because of this, it's basically, you know, as if you were to build a building and then you have a you have a key to it, you know, and you tell everybody, hey, look, if you want to access this 
apartments building, you need this key. But then also somebody else later on down the line, somebody that would work against you has a key as well. And it was because you gave it to them somewhere along the line. But the idea is that they can enter that building anytime they want to, and they can basically create ways for that building to have structural weaknesses and so on and so forth. It's kind of a weak analogy, but it's the best I could think of on the fly. Uh, but nonetheless, I hope the point's kind of getting across that at this point in time, the, the weakness of Green Lanterns to the color yellow is just believed to be because it's just the color yellow. Now, of course, what this does is create a rift in Hal Jordan because it's like, well, that's stupid. Like, I mean, that's not an answer. Like, Green Lanterns are weak to the color yellow because it's the color yellow. Like, that's not an answer at all. Like, what's the yellow impurity? Why is it that, that, that yellow is considered impure in the realm of Green Lanterns? But Kilowog doesn't have answers to this. No one has answers to this except for the Green Lanterns themselves. Now, of course, Green Lantern Rebirth, which, you know, of course, we already had that video uploaded. That answers that question. That's Jeff Johns giving us the answer for why it is that there's a yellow impurity there. But prior to Kyle Rayner learning the truth about the Parallax entity, no one knew that. No one was aware of what was going on. And so because of this, what actually ends up happening here is we pick up with Tomar. Tomar Ray. Now, Tomar Ray is, is a character that a lot of fans love, but he's also someone who knows who Abensur is. And this is when we begin to learn the legacy of Abensur, how significant Abensur was to the Green Lantern mythos. Abensur wasn't just a guy. He wasn't just a random Green Lantern and he died. And it's like, well, man, that sucks. You know, and his ring got a replacement. Like, we don't know who this guy is, whatever. Like, Hal Jordan is stepping into some very big shoes, some very large shoes. But Tomar Ray goes to Hal Jordan and says, look, you carry the ring of Abin Sur. It's important that you know a lot of what Abin Sur knew. And he basically introduces him to the Book of Oa and says, these are the laws of Oa. The Book of Oa, everything you need to know about a Green Lantern is found here. There are things that you simply just cannot know about, but in this book, you will find the legacy of great warriors past. Abin Sur is one of those. It's an ending to his tale. A time will come when your tale will end and you will be in the Book of Oa. The time will come when Tomar Ray's tale will end and he will be in the Book of Oa. We'll all be added to the book and we will all contribute to the greater whole that is the Green Lantern mythos, the Green Lantern landscape. Now, so this is basically Tomar Ray saying that you stand in something greater than yourself. You stand on the precipice of being part of something this massive in scale. So from here, it's really just kind of like this training montage to a degree that Hal Jordan's learning to become a Green Lantern. He's learning everything that goes along with that, how to create constructs, you know, how it is that his constructs work in conjunction with the color yellow. But the cornerstone behind all this, really in the background of Hal Jordan's mind is there's no reason why Green Lanterns shouldn't be able to use their power against the color yellow. It's just a color. There's no reason it shouldn't be able to work. If there is a reason why why our rings can't work against the color yellow, then it has to be something physical, tangible. It's not a psychological thing. It has to be a physical, tangible thing. And if it's physical and it's tangible, it can be overcome. And so that's the cool thing about this is because Hal Jordan, right off the bat, is pushing the limits of what it means to be a Green Lantern. He's questioning everything. He's questioning everything they know. He's questioning everything that he's been taught. And so what happens is we end up picking up with what seems to be some unknown Green Lantern learning about the death of Abin Sur. And the person, the, the question this person has is, why have I not been told about the death of Abin Sur? Why have I not been told that Abin Sur has been killed? Why am I just now being told? Why wasn't it immediate? Well, of course, the ring's answer is where you were in the middle of a conflict, your focus didn't need to be disrupted, so on and so forth. And so the question, the, the question this Lantern has is, what happened? Take me to where it is that Abin Sur died. Take me to Earth. Of course, this is when we learn that this particular Green Lantern is Sinestro. And so what this does is lead into the very first encounter between Sinestro and Hal Jordan himself. Okay, so continuing on with Green Lantern's secret origin, again, this is why I say that Jeff Johns' run, you know, a lot of the stories that he tells are really self-contained. Secret Origin was designed to be this updated retelling of the early days of Hal Jordan as he became the Green Lantern, you know, while he was the Green Lantern, so on and so forth. It's really just kind of this rehashing of things. So that's why I say this is so cool is because if we take Secret Origin and we basically kick off Jeff Johns' Green Lantern run with Secret Origin, then we create this totally self-contained, cohesive continuity that doesn't require us to really know anything Thing before Jeff John started. That's one of the reasons why it's so cool. There's a few things we need to know here and there, but of course, the second video really picks up with Hector Hammond. Now, again, Hector Hammond, the way that he's introduced here is, uh, is starkly different from, you know, the way that we saw him before. Prior to this, Hector Hammond was still, you know, a bad guy, but the way that he gained his powers was different. The same process was a meteor, but the way it was, or I guess the, the way he came across it was different. It was like in the woods or something along those lines. What this does is make it a little more, make it a little more cohesive, make it make a little more sense in the sense that because of the fact that Hector Hammond is basically 
basically a private con uh, consultant for Ferris Aircraft, for Ferris Air. Um, when Ferris gets a hold of the ship, or at least when the US Air Force gets a hold of the ship that Abensor had crash landed in, Hector Hammond is one of the guys who's investigating it. Now, what Jeff Johns gives us is basically the groundwork for what Hector Hammond will become, which is to say, in this instance, Hector Hammond is very abrasive. His, you know, he really sees things as his way or the highway. But what we also find out is that he is not viewed by anybody in a good way. <laughs> and what I mean here is that where people, you know, with the, the people that he's working with are talking about how the engine core, you know, is kind of kept closed, it's difficult to access, they don't really know what's inside of it, they shouldn't just crack it open. Hector Hammond just busts the thing wide open, and when he does, he's exposed to the meteor, uh, the meteor energy source, and he's basically endowed with telepathy and telekinesis. It modifies the structure of his brain that gives him new powers. The problem is that it's not necessarily something he could control initially. Instead, what ends up happening is just like anybody in comic books who, de uh, who develops telepathy, he begins just, you know, unintentionally reading the mind of those around him. And what he learns is that everybody hates him. People consider him weird. They consider him strange. They consider him somebody who's just socially awkward, doesn't have any social skills. They just look at him as, as, as just a, a, an odd fellow. Now, this is interesting because what Jeff Johns does is he says, look, Hector Hammond could have gone two ways. I mean, this fraction of a second was a crossroads. He could have taken their words to heart and, you know, become something better than what he was, or he could have just stayed on the path that he was on. Now, in truth, with well, the path that he was on, his powers were of such a level that he easily could have just dealt with all these guys. And that's what he does. He lashes out and he kills them all. And, and it kind of makes sense. I mean, opinions are useless to a dead man. And so because of this, Hector Hammond effectively falls down the path of being a bad guy. He falls down the path of being a villain. But what's going to be interesting about this is that instead of just, you know, his powers running amok, he's going to harness them pretty fast. And Jeff Johns is going to say, hey, look, this is why Hector Hammond is going to be a bad guy from this point going forward. Now, of course, from here, we pick up with the return of Hal Jordan. That's one of the cool things here is Jeff Johns kind of plays it fast and loose with regards to Hal Jordan returning to Earth, but he does it in a way that makes sense. What Hal Jordan basically says is that once he was finished with his boot camp training, the ring said, you will be alerted of any extraterrestrial threats in your sector. Now you're going back home and the ring just teleports him back to Earth. Now, of course, he comes across Tom, the mechanic at Ferris Air. Of course, Tom, prior to Jeff Johns Green Lantern, we knew that Tom was kind of like this uh, really close friend of Hal Jordan and was one who was basically kind of going through this whole, you know, the last will and testament of Hal Jordan. We talked about in our video about Kyle Rayner becoming God. But what we also find out is that where uh, Arden Air Force or Arden Air was this place basically where, you know, former pilots, existing pilots, you know, were helping to test aircraft with Ferris Air moving in with the intention of buying Arden Air, all the pilots have quit. Now, this is not because of the fact that it's just viewed as a hostile takeover. It's not because of loyalty to Arden Air. It's because of the stigma that follows Ferris Air. And this tells us how deep the death of Hal Jordan's father goes, that it doesn't just impact him. The pilots everywhere look at Ferris Air and say, that guy took shortcuts. Carl Ferris took shortcuts. And when he did, it resulted in the death of an Air Force pilot. Nobody wants to fly a death trap. And that's what they're afraid of. They're afraid that the Ferris Air will show up and say, hey guys, here's an aircraft that the, the Air Force wants to test. Here's another aircraft the Air Force wants to test. And they have, you know, they're afraid they'll have no idea if the time they go up in the air to test that, that you know, whatever that aircraft happens to be, if that will be their last time. Nobody wants to go the way of Hal Jordan's father. So because of this, Carol Ferris really kind of has to look around and realize that because of the things that her father did, that she's basically running a failing business that nobody wants to come in and you know as, as, as great as it is with her being you know a, a test flight company of what use is her company if no one's willing to test you know aircraft for her company and so with the arrival of Hal Jordan this is kind of cool because this is kind of uh, this is I love the way that Jeff Johns does is it's one of these things where like opposites attract and again they have a history you know I mean well a history only in so far as like Hal Jordan knew her when she was a kid but I like the whole idea of like opposites attracting and this is that Hal Jordan walks in and he basically says yeah like you know when, when Carol when Carol's like hey are you here to quit too. He's like, yep, like put my name on the list of resignations. <laughs> and they start arguing and bickering with one another. But then this is really when Hal Jordan starts to let it out and says, look, you know, the reason why everybody's leaving is because they don't trust you. They don't trust the name of your family. Your dad took shortcuts. They're afraid you're going to take shortcuts and you're going to get somebody killed. Now, one thing to keep in mind here is that because of the actions of Hal Jordan, remember, he had basically punched out his superior officer, General Stone. You know, he had basically been booted out from the Air Force. His desire to fly lasted only so long as someone who was basically a friend of the family would kind of sneak him under the radar, give him a help, give him a helping hand here and there. What Carol Ferris is offering is the ability to get him back into the air, to officially reinstate him as somebody who can legally fly aircraft. Now, Hal Jordan's initial response is one of anger, one of outrage, because he doesn't want to be part of, of Ferris Air. But at the same time, it's an allure that he can't avoid. And that's what's so cool about Hal Jordan. That's one of the things that I love about his character so much is because Hal Jordan has a power ring, right? I mean, he, all he has to do is, is slap on his Green Lantern ring, say, the words, charge his ring, and fly. That's all he has. I mean, he could just fly. But for him, it's about jets because jets have damage.
danger. A jet could fail. Somebody could crash into him. A bird could hit him at the wrong angle. A meteor could come crashing into the earth that's not big enough to destroy a planet, but certainly big enough to take out a jet. There's any number of things that could happen that could put his life in danger. It's the thrill of flying a jet. Not only that, a jet's been his entire life. It's, it's, it's been everything that he's, that he's known. And so because of that, flying with his own ring is not the same as flying a jet. And in the end, flying a jet is something that he can't leave behind anymore. And so he basically ends up allying himself with Carol Ferris. Now, at this point, we switch back over to Atrocitus. So this is why I say Jeff Johns did so much world building in the Secret Origin. And it's one of the reasons why I wanted to basically kind of jump back and do the Secret Origin first. This is when we start to get really into the idea of the prophecy of the Blackest Night. Prior to this point, it was just, well, Abin Sur was told by Atrocitus of the prophecy of the Blackest Night. We have no idea what that means. Of course, we know now that the, the prophecy of Blackest Night means that there will be a, basically a, a rise of different Lantern Corps. All those Lantern Corps will go to war with one another. They will all be destroyed. There will be no more light, and it'll simply just be the Blackest Night. That's basically kind of, you know, what it means more or less. But what we end up finding out here is that, remember, with Atrocitus being a survivor of the Manhunters wiping out Sector 666 and being one of the remaining, you know, five inversions or whatever it is, because of that, Atrocitus, you know, basically consumes, consumes the heart of men. He basically eats people, <laughs> but he throws their blood onto a skull of sorts. And what he basically ends up getting is this word called William Hand. Of course, the man that we know will eventually become Black Hand, become basically representative of Necron, the entity of the Black Lantern Corps. So again, this is really just kind of Jeff Johns throwing in, you know, peppering in these little tidbits, these little things here and there that give us an idea of how dangerous things can be. Now, of course, with uh, Hal Jordan flying for Ferris Air, once he's actually in the air, once he's taken off as a pilot, for him, all's right with the world. The problem is that this sentiment of all being right with the world comes to an end quick, fast, and in a hurry. And the reason why is because Sinestro shows up in his path. And Sinestro's response is, what are you doing? Now, I'm going to be honest with you guys, Rob Core. Rob Core will be, man, I'm going to be honest. I'm going to be honest with you guys now. I love Sinestro. <laughs> He is amazing. I love Sinestro as a bad guy. Like, even when he was just a Green Lantern, he's just a jerk. But it is hilarious the way he conducts himself. Now, at this point in his path of, of being a Green Lantern, Sinestro is order in the extreme. I mean, he's he's regimented, he's structured. We can tell that by his hair and by how, how well manicured his mustache is. He is a man of order. But he also resents everything that Hal Jordan stands against. And that's why the two bumped heads almost immediately. When Sinestro shows up, Hal Jordan begins, you know, asking all these questions. Well, who are you? Why are you here? Why did you basically destroy a $20 million jet? Sinestro's response is, do not question a superior officer. Do not question someone who's more powerful than you. Well, Hal Jordan immediately is like, well, nope, now I know you're not going to be a friend of mine because I, I challenge superior, like I, I challenge authority all the time. That's exactly what I do. And of course, the two of them kind of butt heads a little bit. But what this is, is Jeff Johns showing up and pointing out all the flaws of Hal Jordan. And that's why I love Sinestro, because with Sinestro being here is one of these things where he's, Sinestro's really good at what he does, and he'll make Hal Jordan even better. The problem is Sinestro is a jerk about the way that he does it, but it's one of these cool things. To kind of sidetrack for a second, I know it doesn't really make any sense here, but bear with me for a second. For years and years and years, I played, I used to play Call of Duty all the time, and I got on YouTube and I watched different YouTubers. There were people out there like the Mark of J. Like, if you pay attention to what he says, he'll make you better as a player. That's basically kind of what's happening here with regards to, uh, to Sinestro. That was the best example I could think of. It kind of comes out of nowhere, but that's the best example I could think of. Uh, Sinestro is, is just, he's just a jerk for all intents and purposes. But if you listen to what he says, he will make Hal Jordan a better person. He'll make him a better Green Lantern. And that's exactly what is up happening. More ironically than that, Hal Jordan is getting a lesson here from Sinestro that most Green Lanterns could only ever dream of having. Like Sinestro would never come down and train new Green Lanterns. He would never play the role of Kilowog. But to get a one-on-one -on -one lesson with Sinestro, the greatest Green Green Lantern in existence, Hal Jordan is getting something that almost nobody ever gets. And this is what he tells me. He says, look, man, your, your constructs are a reflection of your willpower. Your willpower has to be focused. Your willpower has to be trained. Fear will crack your willpower. Anger will crack your willpower. Your willpower has to be pure. And when you achieve that goal, when you make your willpower as pure as it needs to be, nothing is beyond your ability to perform. And this is what he does. He basically re recreates, he brings the plane back together of Hal Jordan. And that's what's so cool is because what, what Sinestro says is you need more training. I'm here because a friend of mine was killed because, you know, Ivan Sur was killed because he's being chased by, by, uh, by atrocities, or at least it's believed to be that case. If you're the Green Lantern of this sector, you need more training. 
training. You need to be taught how to be an effective Green Lantern. And so what ends up happening is, uh, of course, the two of them kind of part ways. They kind of end up, you know, splitting off. Uh, but what is also happening here is, of course, when Hal Jordan gets back to Ferris Air, they're immediately set upon by Hector Hammond. Now, of course, again, this is why I say Hector Hammond is kind of elevated here. You know, his telepathy is telekinesis, but it's kind of removed his humanity. But the cool thing about this is that when it comes to Hal Jordan, when it comes to, to really anybody in particular, physical punches, physical assaults are nothing in comparison to somebody who would be able to assault them mentally. And the reason why is because our thoughts are the one place that we could go where we can be private. We can be alone. Nobody can know what we're thinking. They can speculate. They can guess and be right, but they'll never know with any absolute certainty. It's our one safe haven. It's the last fig leaf. And because of this, you know, it is basically Hal Jordan and Carol Ferris being violated in the most extreme way because their inner thoughts, their inner desires, their lust, their fears, the things that they hate the most, the regrets they have, all of those are just items. They're baubles in the hand of Hector Hammond, just scrolling through them, just perusing through them. And they've never felt a sense of helplessness quite like this. Now, the other thing to keep in mind is that Hector Hammond is very much infatuated, very much lustful after Carol Ferris. I wouldn't call it love. Love is something organic. Love is something true. It takes time to develop. Hector Hammond is just lustful. He just wants to get Carol Ferris between the sheets. That's really all he wants to do here. But Hal Jordan, of course, donning his ring, this is when he begins to learn that his willpower just doesn't seem to be there. That his willpower just doesn't seem to be capable. That for whatever reason, he's not able to tap into it the way that he needs to. Now, of course, we'll learn that this is a reflection of Hal Jordan's own self-doubt. This is a reflection of Hal Jordan's own lack of belief in himself. He doesn't feel like his willpower is there because it isn't there, because it's just not where it needs to be. Now, of course, Sinestro jumps in and basically saves Hal Jordan by way of just, you know, more or less shutting off the air supply of Hector Hammond. But again, this is Sinestro saying, you need more training. You need to be taught better. And that's what he does. Sinestro basically takes Hal Jordan under his ring as they go through all these different investigations. They go through this huge journey to try to find, you know, what find out what happened to uh, what happened to Abin Sur, you know, what it is that, that happened you know, with Atrocitus and, and so on and so forth. Now, the funny thing about this too is that Hal Jordan directly asked Sinestro about why it is that, you know, Green Lanterns are weak to the color yellow because keep in mind, this is before anybody knew that the Parallax entity was confined inside the central battery. And so for all they knew, it was just a weakness to the color yellow. It was just the yellow impurity. They didn't know that the Parallax inside of the central battery was basically seeding weakness into the Green Lanterns themselves. Now, of course, Sinestro says, we don't know. And that's not for you to ask. It's not your job to ask the question of why it is that, that you know, the yellow impurity is there. But even he goes as far as to say, I've been, I've been attempting to seek out the truth for why that's the case. I've been attempting to try to find out why it is that there's a yellow impurity. Now, we know this is basically Jeff Johns kind of saying this is how it is that Sinestro eventually becomes the harbinger, the face of, uh, of Parallax, becomes the, the head of the Sinestro court. This is Jeff Johns saying this is how these things begin to sort of, of grow and evolve and so on. But what is up happening is how Jordan takes Sinestro to where it is that Abin Sur was buried. And this is when Hal Jordan begins to learn of the relationship between Sinestro and Abin Sur, in the sense that Abin Sur was Sinestro's mentor. They were extremely close friends. I would go as far as to say that Abin Sur is probably the one person that Sinestro actually trusted. But of course, with Sinestro being in such close proximity to Hal Jordan, what it does is it triggers the message confined inside the ring of Abin Sur. And what is happening is Abin Sur basically begins to go through and tells Sinestro everything he knows, the prophecy of the Black uh, Blackest Night, the five inversions, everything that's been going on, the idea that there will be a multitude, there'll be like five other lantern cores that will that will crop up. These other lantern cores will basically all go to war against one another, the red, the blue, the indigo, so on and so forth. They'll all go to war against one another and it'll lead to the end of all emotion and everything will come crashing down. He spills out the beans on Atrocitus. The five inversions, these are people that basically came out of the massacre of Sector 666. The Manhunters, the predecessors to the Green Lanterns, basically had a flaw in their programming. Mean, we'll find out what that flaw is and what happened that set them on that path, but there'll be a flaw in the Manhunters program. They'll lay waste to Sector 666. The survivors will come together with an empire of tears and they will eventually form themselves into an enemy of the Green Lantern Corps. This is constantly what's what's happening here. Now, at this point, we switch back over to William Hand with regards to his whole family. Now, the reason why I kind of held off on this William Hand thing for a second is because I wanted to actually wait until we got into the, to the section of the story that delved into William Hand. But essentially, William Hand is a member of a family that deals with funerals. His life is surrounded by death. But something else that I hope you also notice here is that the Black Lantern symbol is William Hand's family crest. It's their family symbol. And that's cool because what this means is that it's not as though these symbols are kind of, you know, preordained. You know, their symbols are just created. They're a reflection of the different cores themselves. Black Hand is a man unto himself. He can resurrect, you know, we'll see the whole resurrection, you know, with, with regards to Blackest Night. But in terms of Black Hand, he's basically a lantern core unto himself. That's kind of how it initially starts out. 
His obsession with death initially leads him to encountering Atrocitus. And Atrocitus begins to talk about, you know, you're a, you're a doorway into the darkness. You're a person that's going to, to bring about the Blackest Night. Now, of course, we'll find out really how this Blackest Night uh, prophecy stands once we get to Sinestro Core War. But this is still pretty cool because what this basically says is that it's not enough that there are going to be lanterns that are basically going to wage war against one another and they're all going to die. There's a next step after this. There's the rise of the Black Lanterns, the, the rise of death, of destruction, of darkness, of eternal death, you know, to, to the universe itself. You know, it's this, this really foreboding scenario. But of course, with the arrival of Sinestro and the arrival of Hal Jordan, the cool thing is that Hal Jordan basically gets a crash course in how to use his ring. With regards to the, the fight against Atrocitus, this is not some training scenario. And that's what Sinestro says. You're not in training, my friend. You're not in boot camp. You're in the real world. Either you can harness your willpower and you can succeed or you will fail. But we also get these crash course lessons that, uh, that, that Hal Jordan gets in terms of like pocket dimensions, storing his power battery in some location that will basically keep it safe, keep it from being destroyed. Again, it's, it's all these little small tidbits that go towards Hal Jordan becoming a better Green Lantern. Now, facing off against Atrocitus, because of the fact that, that Hal Jordan is so new, in his mind, he can create constructs to a degree, but they're still not fleshed out. They're still not really where they need to be. They're still not really that capable. Atrocitus can still punch through them. But all this begins to change when Atrocitus says, I know your rage. I know your anger. I know that you are weak. I know that you do not have the ability to be somebody of any real measure. Now, of course, he's saying all this to, to uh, Sinestro in the process of getting ready to kill Sinestro. Hal Jordan comes to his aid, and when he does that, he forces a construct to take out a tractor. Now, under normal circumstances, this would be entirely irrelevant, but the tractor is yellow. The construct should have had no impact on the tractor. The construct should have broken apart on the tractor. The construct should have fallen apart before it reached the tractor because of the yellow impurity. Now, the reason why this matters is because this is where Sinestro really begins to learn what's going on. This is where Hal Jordan himself begins to realize what's going on with the yellow impurity. The yellow impurity is not an intrinsic thing. The yellow impurity is not something that's just inherent to Green Lanterns. It's not just a natural part of the Green Lantern power. The yellow impurity is artificial. It's an external factor. It's an external source. If it can be overcome, that means that it's not part of the Green Lantern landscape. Someone put it there. And so what this does is this really kind of bolsters the curiosity of Sinestro anymore. Now, he doesn't really say anything to Hal Jordan. Hal Jordan kind of makes a comment about, hey, did you see that? I use I used the, the ring against yellow. Sinestro kind of takes this away. The way that Jeff Johns gives it to us, it, it's almost like Sinestro takes this as an affront in the sense that Hal Jordan was able to do something that Sinestro was never able to do. And so it kind of comes across as this situation like, you know, Sinestro feels like he's he's he feels challenged by Hal Jordan. He feels like Hal Jordan has the potential to become better than he is. And that's true in a lot of ways. But more so than that, this is Sinestro learning that the yellow impurity is artificial. There's something in the central power battery that makes Green Lanterns weak to the color yellow. Hal Jordan was able to temporarily over, you know, overcome it. And so again, this really kind of bolsters the curiosity of Sinestro with regards to, to everything that's uh, everything else that's going on. But again, Sinestro is saying your ring, your willpower serves the purpose of forcing you to face your fears. If you cannot face your fears, you will never be an adequate Green Lantern. And so, you know, because of this, uh, we basically have kind of, you know, Hal Jordan flying off on his own, Hal Jordan, you know, trying to avoid Sinestro. But in his anger and in his wrath, he races off to Carol Ferris. He races off to her family home, confronts her and says, I want to speak to your father. I want to speak to Carl Ferris. Breaks into Carl Ferris's room only to find that Carl Ferris is bedridden, that he's sick. He's in no condition to run the company. And this is when we learn the truth of what what was going on. The death of Hal Jordan's father was not done by a man who was just trying to cut corners for the for the purpose of saving a buck. You know, Carl Ferris was trying to keep his business afloat, but the death of Hal Jordan's father crushed Carl Ferris. It, all, it, it, it ate him alive, and it ate him to the point where he basically just kind of began to lose the will to live. And so Carol Ferris has basically been making up a series of excuses. Well, my father's out playing golf. My father's doing this. He's doing that. He'd love to be here, you know? And while she put off the air of the fact that her father basically was too good to be there with the rest of the the grunts, so to speak. What ends up happening here is Hal Jordan learns the truth, you know, that Carol sees herself as a spoiled little girl. She always saw herself as a spoiled little girl, but when the time came for her to step up and to run the family business, she was able to do that. And this is when Hal Jordan's loyalties began to shift. In truth, Hal Jordan was flying for Ferris Air because he wanted just, you know, to just be able to fly again. But Hal Jordan also now feels a kinship to Carol Ferris. And the reason why is because he basically comes to the realization that she's alone. It's just her. There's no one else. It's just Carol 
Ferris. Much like Hal Jordan, he's got nobody else. His brother Jim is, you know, somewhat a part of his life to a degree. His brother Jack hates him. His father's dead. His mother's dead. Hal Jordan feels very isolated, very alone in the world. And in this kind of a situation, what it does is it allows two people to find solace in one another. It allows Carol Ferris and Hal Jordan to come together in a relationship. Now, what this also does is it forces Hal Jordan to reconcile. It forces him to look into himself and to basically let the memory of his father go. And that's what's so beautiful about this is because this whole thing, this whole story, is simply just Hal Jordan not being able to come to grips with the fact that everyone passes, that everyone dies. Sometimes we die in honorable ways. Sometimes there's no honor to it, but everybody passes. The struggle of Hal Jordan's life, the, the failures that he, he'd experienced, his recklessness, you know, his inability to tap into the full might of his willpower, all of that extended from the fact that he could not let his father go. But he finally does. He finally comes to grips with it. He finally comes to terms with it. And this is the real lesson of Sinestro. And this is this is the moment. This is this is the moment in this story where I was like, this is when I now begin to love Sinestro. This is why Sinestro is now my favorite villain. There's this great exchange between the two of them. It's one of the coolest exchanges ever. There's a great exchange. What Sinestro says is, you have now learned the power of the Green Lantern Ring. The Green Lantern Ring is, it gives you the will to do the things that you need to do. Whatever those things may be. The, the Green Lantern Ring will give you the willpower to let your father go. The Green Lantern Ring will give you the willpower to live, you know? And this is what Hal Jordan says, look, I, I understand you're right. And Sinestro's response is, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know I was right. <laughs> And that's why I love that. He doesn't do it like a reasonable human being. He was like, well, I'm glad you're beginning to understand the lessons of a Green Lantern. He's just like, yeah, I know I was right. Like, what a dick. <laughs> that's why I love him so much. He's my favorite guy. But uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's 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 cool. You know, this is also Sinestro kind of teaching, you know, how Jordan about, you know, the, the dangers of anger and, and so on and so forth. But again, it's it's creating a, a measure of respect between the two. You know, it's, it's Sinestro basically saying that when it comes to things like, like regret, when it comes to things like loss, things like guilt, Green Lanterns always struggle with that. And the reason why is because Green Lanterns are always the first ones into the conflict. Green Lanterns end up losing friends. Green Lanterns end up sometimes wishing they'd never made friends in the first place because they end up losing them in battle. You know, but this is what Sinestro says. It's always, that's, that's the eternal struggle. That's the eternal conflict that you go against is the idea that you're constantly facing off against, uh, you know, forces that would seek to, to strip you of your power. Fear, anger, regret, remorse. Those are things that will constantly seek to strip you of your abilities, of your willpower. You have to remain ever vigilant. You can't give up who you are, but you constantly have to stay on the defensive to make sure that your connection with willpower never goes away. Now, of course, at the tail end of this discussion, they're really just kind of like whisked away to, uh, to <laughs> they're really kind of whisked away to the guardians of the universe. And this is really the first time that Hal Jordan is actually meeting them. And the funny thing about this is that Hal Jordan begins to show the guardians what he is about is the best way that I can explain it. Um, the funny thing is, is the Guardians, you know, talk about the new Green Lantern of Sector, you know, 2814. Hal Jordan's like, well, you know, he's like, my name's Hal Jordan. And the and Sinestro's response is, they know that. They know who you are, Hal Jordan. They're well aware of who you are. Now, at this point, this is when Sinestro basically says, hey, look, you know, there was a lot going on. Abin Sur had, had basically died there, so on and so forth. The prophecy of the Blackest Night and, you know, all that kind of good stuff. But again, what ends up happening is the Guardians basically set down the rules, or at least they explain the rules to Hal Jordan, that no Green Lanterns are allowed to team up with one another. They have to patrol their own sector. You know, there are no Green Lanterns that team up. You know, Hal Jordan has his sector, 2814. Sinestro has his sector, 1417. They're not allowed to cross over into each other's sectors. The only time that is permitted is when the Guardians say it's permitted, but they can't go off and do it on their own. Now, of course, Hal Jordan asks the question, why? You know, and because, well, the, the Guardians say, well, because working together, I'm sorry, working uh, working independently makes you stronger. You know, and, and then his question is, why? You know, and then the Guardians are like, well, we've just lived for a billion years. Don't question us. We know what we're talking about. You know, and that's, that's what's kind of interesting here is because, you know, Jeff Johns is setting the seeds of saying that the Guardians will not give the Green Lanterns all the answers they want. You know, some of this is because of the fact that the Guardians themselves just want to maintain information to themselves. Sometimes it's because of the fact that the Guardians just do not want to see the truth of the situation. We'll find that out once we get to the Sinestro Core War and you have Ganthet and you have Sade who are like the two holdouts saying, this is going to happen. The prophecy of the Blackest Night is going to happen, but none of the other Guardians want to listen. So again, you know, it's, it's, it's really kind of cool because despite their vaunted 
you know, lack of emotions, despite their wisdom and how long how long they've been around. The Guardians are very, very much human in terms of how they conduct themselves. Their mysticism, their cloak and dagger attitude, you know, everything's very black and white, some, you know, so on and so forth. But at this point, because of the fact that Hal Jordan's basically just been popping off at the mouth, the uh, Guardians of the Universe are like, you're facing expulsion, dude. Like, we're we're going to kick you out if you keep running, if you keep, you know, talking about who you is. Well, you know, then at that point, Sinestro kind of chimes in and says, look, if you kick out Hal Jordan, you kick out me. You know, now, this is not really Sinestro putting his faith in Hal Jordan. It is to a degree, but it's really more of Sinestro looking at the legacy of Abin Sur. You know, Abin Sur personally said, look, Hal Jordan, like, met him, met Hal Jordan and said, you are my replacement now. It's, it's really just kind of carrying on what it is that, that Abin Sur had going, you know, in terms of passing his legacy on. But I think there is also still, you know, some measure of trust here between Sinestro and Hal Jordan. At the very least, Sinestro probably respects Hal Jordan more so than he respects anybody else, or at least as close as Sinestro can get to respecting a person. But, you know, at this point, because of the fact that the, the Guardians re are not going to give up their greatest Green Lantern, instead, they kind of offer a compromise. What they say is, Hal Jordan will be your direct pupil. He will learn directly from you. He will be your responsibility. If he fails, then that's your failure. And again, you know, of course, Sinestro ends up kind of taking this on, but this is the road that Hal Jordan follows to making him such a great Green Lantern. But again, this really all kind of begins to, to sort of wind down, begins to come to an end with regards to, uh, you know, Sinestro taking the body of Atrocitus, or at least, you know, intending to taking, uh, taking him back to uh, to his mall, to his, really his, his own home, and keep him prisoner there, which we'll find out, you know, as part of the whole Sinestro Corps War, exactly what it was that happened in this scenario. But with Hal Jordan returning back home, and, uh, you know, him being with with Carol Ferris, the two of them are close, but uh, as far as she says, look, you know, it's 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 Miss Ferris, you know, it's not Carol. You know, it's maintaining this, uh, this sort of, this propriety between the two of them. So, while they're not necessarily romantic in the traditional sense, uh, there is always going to be this sort of give and take. There's going to be this tug back and forth between the two of them always looking at the idea that they're basically going to, you know, possibly get together at some point along the line. But again, the road is constantly being set. The, the road is constantly being paved. For example, with Sinestro, you know, sending Atrocitus back to uh, back to Ismael, back to his home planet, what uh, what Atrocitus says is, we've seen the future. We know what fate awaits you. We know that Karuger will descend into absolute civil unrest and riots. We know that it will descend into absolute madness, and you will do the only thing you know how to do. You will force order onto your home people. And when that happens, you are going to become effectively an evil Green Lantern. You're going to fall from the path of the Green Lantern, and you're going to become a bad guy, and the Guardians will turn against you. But again, it's just kind of this cool situation because ultimately the way the story kind of winds down, Hal Jordan, you know, visits with his brother Jim. And Hal Jordan basically says, hey, look, it's time that I be honest with you. It's time that I be a, a good brother for you. It's time that I finally, you know, trust you. I finally open up to you. And he basically says, I'm the Green Lantern. You know, of course, dons his ring, puts on his suit, or at least uh, manifests his suit, and then gives to, uh, gives to, to, you know, Jim, the flight journal of Hal Jordan, the thing that contains everything, this entire origin story as it exists so far. But yeah, I really love this. I mean, I really love this. This origin story, I think, is a lot more complex than a lot of the stories that we're going to see with regards to uh, what goes on in Jeff John's run of, uh, of Green Lantern. The cool thing is we get these little tidbits here and there, you know. All right, guys, so we are officially in it now. I mean, we're, we're starting Jeff John's Green Lantern. The cool thing about Jeff John's Green Lantern, though, is it's really just a fresh starting off point. I mean, we're going to start from the beginning. I mean, every Sunday will be Jeff John's Green Lantern until we finish it. So we're going to be going on... <sighs> really all the way up until the start of DC Rebirth, to be quite frank, uh, because DC Rebirth, how Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps just picks up where Jeff Johns had largely left off. But, um, or I think actually it was, it was probably Robert Venditti, I think, at the tail end of New 52. But regardless, the fact remains here, Jeff Johns' Green Lantern is kind of an overarching term. Like, you'll see this a lot. If you search Reddit, you search Reading Order, something like that, people will say, Jeff Johns' Green Lantern. It's not really just Jeff Johns. I mean, Jeff Johns wrote the main Green Lantern title, but there's also Green Lantern Corps. And what this does is it tells the same story from two different sides. Green Lantern focuses on Hal Jordan. Green Lantern Corps focuses on everybody else. Now, we'll see, like, John Stewart, we'll see Guy Gardner cross over into, uh, really into Hal Jordan's stories, but on the whole, Green Lantern Corps will focus on, like, the Lost Lanterns, the ones that, th that everybody believed were dead, you know, when uh, Hal Jordan became Parallax and supposedly killed everyone, as well as Guy Gardner, uh, Kyle Rayner to a degree, John Stewart, a lot of spacefaring adventures, different things like that. They'll come to a head when we get to, like, the crossovers, so Sinestro Corps War, Blackest Night, Brightest Day, Revenge of the Green Green Lanterns, different things like that. But for right now, this is really just kind of starting off with Jeff Johns' Green Lantern. Now, the cool thing is, remember, this is really just kind of Hal Jordan after he came back, after being parallaxed. Now, a bit of a refresher here for those of you guys who are, uh, those of you guys who are familiar with Green Lantern, bear with me for a second because I think we might be getting a lot of people who were kind of new to this. With DC trying to find a way to reinvigorate Hal Jordan or re reinvigorate the Green Lantern mythos, they basically got rid of Hal Jordan and they replaced him with Kyle Rayner. Now, of course, this came out of the death of Superman because the death of Superman was as good of a point as any. 
money as to basically re you know to reboot the entire Green Lantern mythos or to reinvigorate him. So what DC did is they had Hal Jordan come back from space only to find out the cyborg Superman and a villain named Mongol had destroyed Coast City. And then in return, Hal Jordan may more or less lost his mind. He used his ring for selfish reasons to basically recreate the city, that kind of a thing. And what it did is it set in motion the Guardians chastising him for it. Hal Jordan lost his mind. He went crazy. He killed virtually all the Green Lanterns. He killed uh, all the Guardians of the Universe except for uh, Ganthit. Ganthit, who finally managed to make his way. People kept giving me a hard time about like putting an L in there. It doesn't really matter too much to me, but people were giving me a hard time about it. I was like, whatever, I'll try to pronounce it as best I can. But the fact remains here that, uh, that Hal Jordan basically uh, became Parallax. He adopted the name of Parallax. Now, what Rebirth, I'm sorry, what uh, what Green Lantern Rebirth did is it came back and it said, no, 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 Parallax was not a name that Hal Jordan adopted. Parallax is an actual entity. Now, how that influenced Hal Jordan's life, we'll actually find out over the course of this story. But the cool thing here is that this really kind of gives us a bit of a refresher because you got to remember, you know, Green Lantern Rebirth was one thing. It's another to actually start a new volume. And the good thing about what Jeff Johns does is he gives us a lot of stuff, but he does it in a way that makes sense and is easily digestible as well as treating every single story, every single beginning of a new story arc, as though somebody's picking it up for the very first time. And so again, it's easily accessible. It's just one of those things where, despite its ease of access, it's better when it's read as a whole. And so again, what this does is kind of jump back to the early days of Hal Jordan, uh, basically being, you know, being offered the Green Lantern ring by Abin Sur. Of course, we know that Hal Jordan accepts the offer. And uh, again, it just kind of picks up with him as part of, uh, of Ferris Air. Now, of course, Ferris Air has basically grown, you know, since the last video we did, where we talked about Hal Jordan's secret origin where he was basically the last man standing working alongside Carol Ferris to try to keep Ferris air intact but uh, what this also does is it brings in a person by the name of Cowgirl now again the cool thing about this is that Hal Jordan really kind of reminds us that he never really uses his ring unless he absolutely has to instead you know he prefers to fly without his ring it kind of you know keeps the thrill of exhilaration it keeps things going in terms of him maintaining his interests at the same time uh, there's basically a, a craft of sorts that's been detected by Hal Jordan that's currently you know orbiting the planet Earth when they get there and they investigate it, they end up finding out that this craft, uh, you know, doesn't really seem to have any recognizable features, which is to say it's not Earth made. What this does is it coincides with the arrival of what appears to be a robot, actually a Manhunter. Now, of course, the Manhunter's appearance here just comes with eradicating virtually everybody that it comes across, but this Manhunter looks totally different from the ones we've seen before because the Manhunters, as we know, they are usually cloaked in red. They have a very distinctive look in terms of how they appear. This, this seems to be a new generation. Generation. Now, at this point, we kind of jump into like the aftermath of what's going on with regards to how Jordan's return. Keep in mind, Coast City had been totally obliterated. And the result is that Coast City has actually been dubbed Ghost City. And the reason why is because there's hardly anybody there. Not only that, again, we pick up with Hal Jordan's younger brother, Jim. Now, of course, we saw with regards to Secret Origin that Hal Jordan was trying to reconnect with his younger brother. He was trying to reconnect with him, trying to help him understand where he was coming from, everything that was going on. With the return of Hal Jordan following, you know, of course, his presumed death while he was Parallax eventually becoming the Spectre. He's basically trying to, to reconnect with his younger brother. But what Jim says is that he's not coming back, that he has no intention of coming back to Coast City. Almost no one does. And that's the issue. A lot of money is being thrown behind the redevelopment of Coast City. A lot of money is being thrown behind basically restoring it to the way that it used to be. The problem is that everybody's terrified of living there because either they've lost friends and family when they were there and it's just too hard to go back because people are afraid it'll be destroyed again because people just don't see a reason to go there because there aren't very many thriving businesses. It's one of these circumstances where no one really seems to seems to have a reason to be there except for those who have basically lived there their whole lives and just refuse to leave or people who have moved in because property is cheap and different things like that. But again, in the middle of this conversation between Hal Jordan and his brother Jim, we're basically met with the introduction of Cowgirl. Now, Cowgirl is actually a pretty cool character. Remember, that's her call sign in the Air Force. I, I was never in the Air Force. I've only known a couple people who have, but as far as I'm aware in the Air Force, I guess they have call signs. I'm not 100% sure about that, but in, the, in this instance, this girl's call sign is Cowgirl. Cowgirl. Now, Cowgirl does not seem like she would be relevant, you know, really important. It seems like she'd be a throwaway character. She'll actually be huge when we get to the to the Star Sapphire, and that'll that'll be really really awesome. But again, what we end up finding out here is that with this particular plane that she's flying, it's basically powered by what appears to be Manhunter technology. And this is when we learned that you know, with this vessel that had basically crash landed on Earth, you know, with the the actions of the U.S. government going in investigating so on and so forth throughout the history of Hal Jordan being the Green Lantern, the government had basically stumbled upon. On Manhunter tech. And that's what they're doing. They're basically using it and they're adopting it to their own ends. They're basically trying to figure out a way to replicate Manhunter technology and use it continually. Now, again, at this point, we switch over to a guy named General Stone. Now, again, I know I'm throwing a 
lot at you guys, but this is really a lot of world building by Jeff Johns. That's really what he's doing here. The first couple trades, the first couple volumes, you know, with regards to, you know, like, like this, this particular story, Green Lantern, No Fear, Green Lantern Core Recharge. It's a refresher. It's basically just kind of throwing a lot of stuff at us really, really fast so that we can kind of build on it later on. Now, of course, again, this will all make sense as we go through. It'll all just kind of come together and it'll create a very, very tight knit and cohesive story. So just bear with me on this, on this little part, but General Stone is actually really important to the history of Hal Jordan. The reason why is because, again, General Stone is the reason why Hal Jordan was booted from the Air Force. Hal Jordan was basically trying to find a way to get out of the Air Force so he could go see his dying mother because his dying mother's one request was that as long as Hal Jordan's in the Air Force, he cannot come see her. He punched General Stone, and of course, General Stone had him kicked out. Now, again, the cool thing about this is that with the two of them talking with one another, General Stone does not know that Hal Jordan is the Green Lantern. Instead, it's just, hey, Green Lantern, thanks for saving our pilot, thanks for saving our ship, that kind of thing. But it's basically a reintroduction of familiar faces. Now, General Stone's role will be bolstered, you know, as we go through the Green Lantern stories and so on and so forth. But again, you know, we really just kind of transition to uh, to this Manhunter as it's being carried by convoy and basically seems to go awry, of course, with uh, with Jon Stewart, the Green Lantern, investigating everything that's going on. He's working in tandem with uh, with with Hal Jordan. And of course, Jon Stewart's the one that's kind of doing a lot of the a lot of the legwork. Now, the reason why this is the case, and this creates a little bit of a, a little bit of contention, you know, among some fans of the Green Lantern mythos. The reason why is because because in truth, Jon Stewart is like the number two, Guy Gardner the number three, if you had to go through and rank them. In truth, there are fans out there who love Jon Stewart and don't like anybody else. There are fans who like Guy Gardner and they don't like anybody else. Kyle Rayner, Hal Jordan, it's all the same thing. But Hal Jordan was the first of the Green Lanterns on Earth. And so he really kind of holds a level of superiority among all the other Green Lanterns. The kicker to this, the difference here, is that Jon Stewart brings his own area of expertise. And that's really why it is that Hal Jordan is defective to, to John Stewart here because John Stewart was an architect. John Stewart was in the military. John Stewart has a lot of experience dealing with different scenarios that have to, you know, that coincide with structural weaknesses, determining what it is that caused something to fail. If, if Hal Jordan showed up here, he could probably pull it off, but not as well as John Stewart. And that's the great thing about Jeff John's work here is because Jeff John's looks at each of the individual Green Lanterns, really each of the individual members of the entire Lantern mythos and says, what are their strengths and weaknesses? We'll put them in situations where their strengths are highlighted. We'll take them out of situations where their weaknesses are highlighted and will put somebody else in their place. And so what it does is create a really, really cool and rich method of storytelling where we basically get a lot of the characters at the height of their abilities. Now, of course, a lot of this will be turned upside down with Sinestro Core War, especially given the limitations of the Green Lantern Ring versus the lack of limitations with the Sinestro Core Ring. But the fact remains here that with Hal Jordan, you know, going back to visit his brother, you know, going back to speak with Jim after having previously taken off, Jim kind of reiterates his point that Jim, his wife, his kids, they're not coming back to Coast City. But for Hal Jordan, it's like, look, people are trying to build here. The only way anything is going to grow is if people start coming back. Somebody has to take that first step. And Jim's response is, then go find somebody else. And again, it's really kind of cool here because what it shows us is that instead of making this isolated, instead of treating things as though the destruction of Coast City happened, but nobody really cares about the impact, it tells us the impact lives on. That people are terrified of living there. Nobody wants to be the one who gets blown up on Coast City. Now, again, at this point, it really kind of transitions back Back over to uh, back over to Hal Jordan, continuing on his journey, you know, going through and investigating a lot of this information and so on and so forth with regards to, you know, the Manhunter and, and, you know, that kind of information. But ultimately, with the Manhunter having been successfully transported to a military base with no one being aware that they're basically toting a Manhunter, Hal Jordan's ring kicks into play, you know, recognizes a Manhunter is currently in the vicinity. And the result is that, of course, he activates and uh, the two of them kind of begin, you know, battling with one another, you know, going towards one another. Now, again, the cool thing is that with Jeff Johns writing this story, what he does is basically give the reader, you know, us as the reader, a refresher on who the Manhunter, uh, Manhunters are. And he does this organically. He does it by way of, you know, when Hal Jordan tells, asks his ring what the heck's going on, the ring goes through a quick explanation of the Manhunters, which we can go ahead and do that here. So, uh, with regards to people who were who were new to the whole mythos, the Manhunters were really like up until the most recent retcon with regards to uh, the origin of Ulthum. The Manhunters are basically the predecessors to the Green Lanterns. So the reason why is because of the fact that the Guardians have basically given up their emotion. And the line of logic from the Guardians of the Universe was that individuals who have emotion, who were tied into their emotions, can be easily manipulated. They can succumb to wrath. They can succumb to happiness, to love, to anger, so on and so forth. What we need are people who will basically carry out their mission, no questions asked. The Manhunters were designed to be that way. The issue was that a programming glitch took place in the 
Manhunters, where they started going on a violent crusade, where they basically said, the only way to keep the to keep the universe in order is to eliminate all life. People, you know, races, different organisms cannot succumb to anger if they don't exist. They can't go to war if there's nothing for them to go to war over because they're all dead. The problem with this is that, of course, the Lanterns were created in order to respond to the idea that the Manhunters were too extreme, and the Green Lanterns really just kind of grew and, and expanded ever since. But the Manhunters have cropped up from time to time, and this is one of those instances where the question is, okay, how did this Manhunter get here? Well, we're kind of left to believe this Manhunter got here at some point in the distant past, you know, at some point along the line, and it was just now discovered. And in fact, that's the case that's actually going to be made. The kicker is that in the middle of the conflict between Hal Jordan and this Manhunter, the newer version of the Manhunter that's cloaked in blue shows up. Now, of course, Hal Jordan looks at it as a person that, you know, as a being that looks human and thinks it is some kind of backup, whether it's a superpowered being that he's never seen before or something along those lines. But of course, this sand, uh, second Manhunter turns against Hal Jordan and attacks him. Well, then the question that Hal Jordan has is where, where did this Manhunter come from? Because it looks brand new. It looks newly created. If the Manhunter is newly created, who's making it? Who, who are, who's making these new generations of Manhunters? The other half of this being because this new Manhunter basically looks at the more damaged version and says, you're older, you're archaic, you're not new like I am. And so that's where Jeff Johns really begins to kind of set the seeds, plant the seeds of what's going on. Now, a lot of this will be answered in Green Lantern Corps, but with regards to what's going on at the moment, this is an example of what Jeff Johns does, where he basically engineers a situation where questions are kind of being asked, where people are trying to figure out what's going on. At the same time, something else that we also learn here is that with this newest iteration, of the Manhunters, they're not like previous versions. Instead, this newest version has the ability to absorb Green Lantern energy. And so what it does is it makes the Manhunters a lot more dangerous than they were before, because instead of a man, uh, instead of a Green Lantern having to run up on a Manhunter and deal with their enhanced strength and so on and so forth, now the Manhunters will absorb green energy from Green Lanterns. And so again, it creates kind of a weird situation because Hal Jordan is trying to figure out what's going on, is trying to figure out where things are going. Now, of course, at this point, he goes and, and begins to kind of question General Stone. And it's kind of cool because General Stone is really stonewalling him here. I mean, not to do a play on words, but he's like, hey, look, man, a lot of this is confidential information. You know, it's it's top secret. We can't really tell you what we're doing. We can't tell you about this tech. We can't give you any of that stuff, you know? And in the end, you know, Hal Jordan's like, look, I need information. And he actually ends up punching General Stone. Now, of course, that's when General Stone basically figures out who, ha who Green Lantern is. He knows right off the bat that Green Lantern is Hal Jordan. Now, he doesn't tell him immediately. You know, he just kind of gives him a little bit of information here. Hal Jordan says, look, I need to borrow your jet. I've got to go chase after this Manhunter. Remember, Hal Jordan's ring has been drained of energy quite a bit. And so, uh, you know, in the pursuit of this of this Manhunter, again, it leads to a pretty crazy chase. Of course, you've got General Stone on one side of the comms, you've got Green Lantern on the other, but it's really just kind of a back and forth here. I mean, it's really more of like an action segment, more so than any real, you know, genuine information to go on here. Now, of course, because of the fact that Hal Jordan can't really summon his Lantern at the moment, he basically just uses the head of the, of the Manhunter to basically re-energize his ring. But again, the question that he's asking here is, where did this Manhunter come from? Not only that, one of the Manhunters begins to basically experience or begins to show emotion. And that's why things are beginning to look funny to Hal Jordan because Manhunters are inherently devoid of emotion. But where this Manhunter that he's basically taking out of the atmosphere and getting ready to, to you know, leave out in space due to the fact that its self-destruct mechanism has been activated in the final moments of its life, the Manhunter says it feels fear. Manhunters never feel emotion. And so the question Hal Jordan has is, how did we get to this place? Why is this Manhunter feeling emotion? This Manhunter should not feel any emotion of any kind whatsoever. And so what he does is, you know, Jeff Johns kind of gives us this little bit of a teaser where he basically kind of picks up with, uh, with Hal Jordan and says, look, there is someone out there who is making these these you know these robots making these new manhunters these new manhunters are a little different they're a little more capable and so the idea is what what exactly are they going to be able to pull off what exactly are they going to be able to do now at this point we really kind of jump to like this weird little story that that Jeff Johns gives us but it's basically him kind of leading into the prophecy of the blackest night leading into the idea that we're basically going to come to a war of all the different lantern corps now initially this just kind of picks up with just some alien out in out in the desert somewhere. <laughs> and it's actually hit, you know, by a vehicle. The alien simply says, you know, I just went out for a cigarette. But it's also kind of cool here because we get this little bit of a return to familiarity with Hal Jordan visiting the different uh, members of the Green Lantern Corps. Now, of course, uh, he and Kilowog kind of get into a bit of a beef. They get into a little bit of a battle with one another, but it's really a friendly one. It's not designed to be violent by any stretch of the imagination. But in the midst of this, Hal Jordan is contacted by Hector Hammond. And Hector Hammond says, they're back. Now, again, this is Jeff Johns 
changing things up a bit, adding these little tidbits of information that will go towards expanding the mythos. Now, with regards to this alien that was hit by a car and, you know, was basically taken by the U.S. government, that what ends up happening is they basically start going through its body and realizing that this alien is basically human, but it's been aged by like 50,000 years or something silly like that. It's basically what humans will become at some point along the line due to their, you know, evolutionary process, evolutionary continuation. And so because of this, Hal Jordan goes to visit Hector Hammond since Hector Hammond was the one that contacted him. Now, again, Hector Hammond's a really, really cool villain. He's one of those guys that I find to be really intriguing just because of the fact that Hector Hammond can't actually move anywhere. I mean, he's got a massive head and has to be kept on some measure of a, of a support system in order to keep it from just kind of, you know, flopping over. But Hector Hammond is also a guy that because he can't control his physical body, because he's strictly a telepathic and tele telekinetic being, that he can't enjoy the small luxuries of life. And that's the coolest thing about this is that when Jeff Johns gives us this little bit of a story, it's basically him, you know, kind of showing us what life would be like without the ability to taste, without the ability to experience love, physical love, emotional love, different things like that. What Hector Hammond says is, I will tell you what's going on, but you have to let me have a memory. You have to let me have an experience. Some girl that you were with, some girl whose conversation you paid attention to, you know, let me let me experience that, you know, that, that flittering of love, you know, the, those butterflies in your stomach, the hope that something great will come out of the night. You know, let me have that memory. Of course, Hal Jordan gives it to him for a slight second, but then Hector Hammond tries to overwhelm him. Now, again, this is cool because what it does is it shows us the experience that Hal Jordan has with Hector Hammond. Because Hector Hammond is a guy who doesn't have normal abilities, because he's not a normal person, he relies almost exclusively on telepathy, the impact of damage done to his mind is amplified that much more. And so what Hal Jordan does is basically reach into his brain, of course, using his uh, using his lantern technology, and initiate or at least kind of uh, stimulate the, uh, the, the pain sector of Hector Hammond's mind. And so literally, he's just kind of sending his body into an extreme form of pain. Now, of course, what Hector Hammond does is basically spill the beans and say that there are these beings that exist out there, these weird little aliens that don't do anything more than just kind of like mess with people. They kidnap stuff, you know, kidnap individuals. They just kind of experiment on them, see what all they can pull off. And uh, of course, you know, what Hector says is I'm not the only one. Now, again, this really kind of seems out in left field. It really kind of seems out in the middle of nowhere, but all of this is designed for the purpose of building up to something bigger. Again, we really just kind of switch over to Coast City, you know, to the, the water off the off the coast of, of Coast City, and we end up finding basically a shark that's been mutated. Now, this is not King Shark, all right? This is basically just a normal shark who's physical design has been manipulated and been screwed up by these particular aliens and been jump-started into the future, you know, so that it's basically evolved at an extremely rapid rate. Now, again, at this point, all this really does is just show Hal Jordan facing off against the shark. There's really nothing of any major substance here. The only exception to this is when we switch over to Palmdale and Hillside Park, and we basically end up joining with William Hand. Now, remember, the last time we saw William Hand, he had basically had, he had lost his hand when the specter had taken it. And so because of this, what this does is it basically kind of gives us this idea that William Hand is kind of this avatar of death in the sense that if William Hand goes through and touches things and drains the life energy out of things, then what it does is it begins to regrow his hand. Now, it's not like he could touch a tree and the whole thing comes back. It just sort of begins to grow back. And what William Hand begins to realize is that in order for him to regrow his entire hand, he's going to have to basically absorb the life force of people. So that's literally what he does. He starts traveling around and basically absorbing the life force out of doctors, out of nurses, out of patients that are currently dying, out of virtually every single person that he comes across and reconstitutes his physical hand. Now, the reason why this matters is because of the fact that this is Jeff John sitting down and laying the groundwork for Black Hand being an avatar of Necron, the entity of the Black Lantern Corps. And so what this does is, as far as I can tell, is it takes the previous standing of Black Hand and it modifies it a bit. And what I mean by that is William Hand is a long standing villain of the Green Lantern mythos. He originally appeared in 1964. The issue here is that back in the early days, he was just a goofy guy. He was just a goofy little villain. He would spat out these little cliche lines. There was nothing of any real substance to his character. Jeff Johns coming back with Secret Origin changed things up. You know, there was a point whereby William Hand had this device that would absorb Green Lantern energy. And so what Jeff Johns is doing is basically saying, look, William Hand is part of a much bigger picture. You know, where the Green Lanterns are avatars of the willpower entity in the emotional spectrum, Black Hand is the avatar of Necron, of the Black Lantern Corps 
the same way that the Star Sapphires are avatars, or the same way that the Indigos are avatars, and so on and so forth. Sinestro, you know, an avatar of Parallax, different things like that. That they basically draw off the energy of the emotional spectrum. Now, again, this basically picks up with Hal Jordan discovering who these aliens are. These aliens kind of experimenting on Hector Hammond. Hector Hammond basically saying they're the ones that made him the way he was. That instead of Hector Hammond simply just stumbling across the the ship of Abin Sur and then turning around and activating this uh, this meteor unintentionally, that instead the the aliens had basically engineered this situation so that the U.S. military would find the ship of Abin Sur and then turn around and experiment on it, resulting in Hector Hammond becoming who he is. Again, we had talked about that in the uh, Secret Origin of Hal Jordan. But at this point, we basically transition over to William Hand encountering Hal Jordan again. Now, this is where the tables have turned. This is where things are different. And even within the comic, Jeff Johns talks about this. You have Black Hand, who's basically taunting Hal Jordan, saying, there was a time where I was just a small-time guy. I was a small-time villain. Now I'm an actual serious foe. Now I'm an actual serious threat. More so than that, what Black Hand is basically saying is, Hal Jordan, you should be dead. You should not be alive. You were supposed to be dead. You were supposed to be gone. Somehow you have survived. It shouldn't be that way. And so again, it's really this idea of William Hand's entire obsession with the idea of death coming to bear. Now keep in mind, William Hand's not acting of his own volition. You know, his mind had more or less been kind of messed with, been tampered with. He's been influenced by Necron time and time again. This all really feeds off of Black Hand's obsession with the concept of death. Remember, you know, William Hand's family were basically corners. They dealt with corpses day in and day out. William Hand's life is immersed in death. And that's exactly what he tells Hal Jordan. He says, your whole life is surrounded by death. The death of your father, the death of your mother, the death of the relationships between you and your brothers. Your life is nothing but death and destruction. You yourself have reaped death on a multitude of different people. Now, again, it's really kind of showing us the fact that there's somebody out there that holds such an absolute belief in the value of death. But again, Hal Jordan's response here is that he's not really afraid of death so much as he hates death. But even then, he basically says, without life, death is nothing. So again, this is Jeff Johns fleshing out the emotional spectrum. This is Jeff Johns basically telling us on one end you have white, on one end you have black, you've got stuff in between, but the emotional spectrum spreads throughout all forms of existence. Life, death, willpower, love, all these different things are all part of the emotional spectrum. And so again, it's, it, it's really cool because it's just kind of laying the early groundwork, planting the early seeds. We are by no means in the realm of seedlings right now. We basically just have seeds in the ground, we're nurturing them and trying to see what we can grow them into. And that's why Jeff John's writing is so good, is because instead of just simply saying, and now one day we have the Black Lanterns, instead, it's a slow build. It's a slow burn. And then it grows into this giant monstrosity of this incredible writing that just turns out to be something absolutely gorgeous. But again, what this story does is it basically kind of ends on the notion that Hector Hammond has, has essentially regained his ability to talk, you know, where he's no longer uh, confined to just kind of being stuck in this, uh, this deteriorated body, that he's regained the ability to talk. Now, how far this will go is something we don't know. But again, this, these little, you know, aliens are basically handed over to the Green Lanterns, the other green, other members of the Green Lanterns, you know, for their own sectors. So they could basically, you know, be taken back and put on trial and that kind of thing. But again, this is really all just world building stuff. The story itself seems like it has nothing to do with anything, but it has everything to do with everything. It's going to be one of these where we'll actually reference this later on in future videos. So again, this is why I wanted to do it all because, you know, I don't really want to leave anything to chance. I don't want to leave anything out. Even if the story seems totally irrelevant, seems totally unnecessary, we're going to cover it anyway. And the reason why is because, you know, with what Jeff Johns does, this is, I really can't harp on this enough. What Jeff Johns does is he'll write Sinestro Corps. All right, he'll write Sinestro Corps War and he'll reference one panel from this entire story. But it's important that we know what's going on, that we can all kind of have this, this well-rounded, huge, uh, particular understanding of, of the whole thing. I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm getting kind of carried away with this. I'm really excited. I'm really, really excited to do these stories. All right, so the Revenge of the Green Lanterns prelude is amazing. It's super good. Actually, we'll get to see Batman become a Green Lantern, like, or at least what it would look like with him as a Green Lantern. It's only for a moment, but it is pretty stellar. It's pretty awesome. That's one of the things that I really loved about Jeff Johns' writing is this, like, you get to see these cool little moments of characters that you would never see put on a lantern ring suddenly become a lantern, and it is... <laughs> it looks amazing. Batman as a Green Lantern looks incredibly amazing. It's one of the coolest 
those things we're ever going to see. So uh, initially, this picks up with Hal Jordan on uh, on Oa, and he's actually talking to Salak. Now, the reason why this is Revenge of the Green Lantern's prelude is because of the fact that the, the main Revenge of the Green Lantern story is going to deal with the fallout, the direct fallout of Emerald Twilight. Now, for those of you guys who are new to the Green Lantern mythos, if I bring up the name Parallax, you guys are probably going to think of Parallax as like the giant yellow entity. And that makes sense because that's what he is now. He's he's uh, he's the entity. He's the, you know, the representation of the emotional spectrum with regards to fear. But back in the 1990s, Parallax was just a name that Hal Jordan gave himself. And so when, Par when, when Hal Jordan just started running around operating as Parallax, uh, he killed basically all the Green Lanterns. Uh, you know, he really took their rings and so on and so forth, destroyed them all. Like his ring was recreated and given to Kyle Rayner, but uh, he was basically just a bad guy. And so what Revenge of the Green Lanterns is going to do is it's actually going to show us that not all of those original Green Lanterns died, that some of them lived, but they've simply been held away. They've been kept in stasis by Cyborg Superman uh, ever since their, their presumed death or ever since the events of Emerald Twilight took place. Now, of course, the reason why this is significant is because of the fact that Salak basically sits down with Hal Jordan and says, look, man, like the, the Guardians of the Universe have basically absolved you. They, they've welcomed you back into the fold. They said you're no longer a guy who's to be shunned. You're a member of the Green Lantern Corps who's to be celebrated and really the greatest of the Green Lantern Corps. But what Salak says is just because the, the Guardians have forgiven you doesn't mean everybody else has. He simply says you're going to want to watch your back because the veterans know what you did. They've heard about what you did. Uh, those individuals who are brand new will hear about what you did. And some individuals may have lost friends and family. Some people inherited the rings of their mothers and fathers. And so because of that, they're going to blame you for the loss of the ones that they care about. And if you're not careful, it's going to cost you your life. So again, what this does is it shows us that just because they're Green Lanterns doesn't mean there's not infighting. It doesn't mean that there's not bickering and arguing and that some individuals just can't get along and that there aren't grudges being held. All of that stuff still exists. And that's why it's so cool is because Jeff Johns does not take this standard of, well, they're all Green Lanterns and they're all best friends. No, he says they're Green Lanterns, but a lot of them don't like each other. And a lot of them would rather kill other Green Lanterns than see somebody wear that lantern ring. So again, it's really kind of a cool idea here. What we do is again, because of the fact that Hal Jordan largely focuses on events that are on Earth, we transition over to Gotham City. And the reason why is because of the fact that Batman informs uh, Hal Jordan that there's someone running around called the Tattoo Man. Now, of course, the cool thing about this is Jeff Johns draws on the existing Hal Jordan mythos. Remember, when Green Lantern Rebirth was launched and Hal Jordan came back and the whole history of Parallax and everything was explained, Jeff Johns, it wasn't like a hard reboot. Jeff Johns didn't wipe the slate clean from the Green Lantern mythos. We can treat it that way, but it isn't that way. In truth, the entire history of Hal Jordan remains intact. He was first given the Green Lantern ring by Evan Sewer. He went on to become, uh, you know, one of the most capable Green Lanterns. He was, of course, you know, he really had um, Sinestro as his main villain. Eventually, he became Parallax. Kyle Rayner took his place as the last Green Lantern. And then we went into Green Lantern Rebirth back when, when everything was kind of uh, kind of started over again by Jeff Johns. But the reason why I bring that up is because Hal Jordan makes reference to a guy who is actually the original Tattooed Man. What Hal Jordan says is that the only tattooed man he knows about is a guy by the name of Abel Tarrant. And Abel Tarrant was the tattooed man for quite some time and basically had the ability to make his tattoos take physical form. But the new one is a guy by the name of Mark Richards. Now, Mark Richards uh, is actually just kind of like what we get here in this story is really all we get for his character, barring, you know, Final Crisis. But prior to that, all we had here was all that we got. He was just a guy. He was a former U.S. Marine. He just showed up on the scene one day. He had the ability to turn his tattoos into physical beings. And then those those tattoos will carry out his own wishes, attack people, different things like that. The most recent victim is a guy by the name of Rosen. And this guy was basically killed. And then, you know, what was written on his chest was simply the phrase weakness women. And that seems to be the basis behind the tattooed man is he literally goes around and kills people for their sins. Now, the other half of this is that Batman really kind of looks down on Hal Jordan. Now, we know that Batman doesn't like lanterns and all of this really stems back to Emerald Twilight. Well, I wouldn't say that Batman and Hal Jordan were ever the best of friends. I would say that Hal Jordan was the last person Batman expected to turn villain, to turn into a bad guy. And so that issued a lot of betrayal on behalf of Batman. He's never really liked lanterns following the events of Emerald Twilight. Now, he does hold a special grudge for Hal Jordan. And because of this, you know, with, with Hal Jordan, despite the fact that he showed up, he cast off his identity as Parallax. He's no longer the Spectre. It's just Hal Jordan, the pilot and Green Lantern. Batman still wants to get even. And of course, he does this by punching the heck out of him. <laughs> he punches the absolute absolute heck out of him. And that's it. No muss, no fuss. That's one of the really cool things. That's one of the things I like about guys. I think, I don't think guys hold grudges for a lengthy amount of time. That was a lesson I learned in middle school. In middle school, two girls would start fighting at the beginning of the year and they would fight for the whole year. 
the whole school year with guys that wasn't like that. Guys are like, yeah, man, like I don't like you. And then they'd fight and either they were friends or they just didn't like each other from then on out. But they wouldn't fight every day. You know, they wouldn't take pot shots at each other and stuff like that. But the fact remains here that with their differences more or less set aside, even if only for the time being, what Jeff Johns does is he actually gives us some really cool insight into the differences between Batman and, and Hal Jordan. What we know about Batman is Batman is a, is a creature of the night. I mean, that, that's his thing. He hides in the shadows. You know, he pops out of cracks in the ground. You know, he shows up out of nowhere and subdues various villains. He relies on fear in order to ensure that those individuals who would commit a crime don't commit a crime, or at the very least, think twice about it. Hal Jordan, on the other hand, does not view himself that way. In his mind, he wants to be a beacon for villains. He wants all villains everywhere to see him. And his motivation behind that is when he says, the reason why is because well, he wants the villains to see him instead of anybody else. He wants the villains to target him instead of targeting innocent people. So again, it's actually a really cool philosophy between the two of them. But this fight with regards to, to Mark Richards, with regards to the tattooed man, is pretty short lived. But the reason why this is a prelude for uh, revenge of the uh, of the Green Lanterns is because of the fact that in their conflict, what Mark Richards does is he confirms the fact that the various tattoos he has on his body are in relation to the sins that people have committed. Murder, wrath, greed, arrogance, different things like that. The sins of man, the things that basically bend people towards tendencies regarding evil as opposed to good. And what he does is he look at, looks at Hal Jordan and he says, there are so many sins on you. Murder, betrayal, lies, deceit. You are a sinful man. And it's basically Jeff John hearkening to the idea that there's a lot of history that Hal Jordan hasn't dealt with. And that's true. Hal Jordan just kind of showed up on the scene and said, hey, I'm back. I'm back to my normal self, guys. I'm ready to be a superhero again. And that was it. That was really all we got up to this point. There was no indication, no inclination that he had any intention to make up for his past misdeeds. And we'll talk about that more when we get to Revenge of the Green Lanterns. But of course, with Batman being the other half of this equation, Batman joins into the fray and then subdues Mark Richards pretty quick. I mean, it's, it's like a, it's a two page battle. I mean, and there's really not much about it, but that was the basis was to basically take the guy out and call it a day. Now, the other half of this, and the reason why, one of the ways that we get to see Green Lantern Batman is when Hal Jordan sits down with him and says, I want to show you something. I want you to do something. And when Batman turns around, he gives him or hands him the Green Lantern ring and he simply says, put it on, put it on and try to use it. Now, oh, really a lot of this is because of the fact that it's Hal Jordan's gift to Batman. With regards to the Green Lantern ring, Jeff Johns is kind of explaining this to us and simply saying the ability to overcome great fear is fear of the unknown, but fear of your own past. It's fear of the mistakes that you've made and fear that you may fall right back down to those mistakes again. With regards to Batman, it feeds on the fear that he has in himself. Batman's not really afraid of villains. Batman's not really afraid of bad guys. He's not really afraid of ultra powerful people like Superman, despite the fact that they're heroes. Batman is afraid of the fact that he won't honor his parents. Batman is afraid of the fact that he's going to fail the task that he set for himself. Now, the way that we know this is because Hal Jordan says you can't forget about the things that happened to you. But when you're in that, that space in between the bad experiences that you've had and your attempt to let them go, that's where the power of the ring comes from. Batman harnesses it and is able to harness the power of the Green Lantern. And it is the coolest looking thing ever. It is, it's so awesome, you know? And, and Hal Jordan simply says, overcome this fear. Put that moment behind you. Put your childhood fear of Joe Chill. Put the fear that you felt when your parents were shot. Let that go put that behind you. Now, Batman's response is, I don't want to. But the way that this happens is with him basically conjuring constructs and he conjures constructs of his parents. And that's what's so cool about this is because of all the things that he could have conjured, the one thing he wanted to see was his parents. And it's a really touching moment. It's a beautifully done moment because right now, this is not Bruce Wayne, Batman. It's not the scary, terrifying Bruce Wayne, Batman. This is the kid, Batman. This is eight, nine, 10 year old Bruce Wayne is what this is. That's why Jeff Johns, Green Lantern, man, Jeff Johns, man. If God were writing Green Lantern right now is what it'll look like right now. It is an amazing little bit of storytelling here. And so again, you know, Bruce Wayne, Batman basically says, I don't want to put this behind me. And the motivation behind this is because of the fact that if he put his childhood fear behind him, if he put away the fear that he might not live up to the honor of his parents, if he puts away the fear that after, you know, his time as Batman is done, that he just hasn't made Gotham safe, then th there wouldn't be a reason for him to be Batman. He would basically be forced to walk away for the mantle. And so for this moment, for, for right now, he simply says, the fear that I have of failing my parents, the fear that I, I felt as a child and the anger that I feel now is my motivation for continuing to be Batman. And I will not rest until Gotham City is safe. And so because of this gift that Hal Jordan gave to Batman, it was basically kind of a mending of rifts. It's the two of them coming together to a degree and Batman finally saying, thank you. You know, I'm glad you're back. And so what this does, it just kind of sets the stage. I mean, they're not the best of friends. It's not like Green Arrow 
on Green Lantern, they're not the best of friends, but the various rifts that existed between the two of them, the animosity that Batman had for Hal Jordan is for the most part beginning to go away. So from this point going forward, we are on the road to Sinestro Core War, which I'm really, really excited about. This is actually, it's, it's a really, really great story. But again, the way that Jeff Johns does this is just by building up little tidbits here and there, giving us these little small things, these tiny little things that just sort of pop up from time to time. And we'll actually see that take place uh, here in this video, at least the very early days of it all kind of coming together. But the idea here is that we initially pick up one year later. Now, with regards to the Green Lantern mythos, it's the Green Lantern Core and the Green Lantern one year later. The reason why is because, of course, when we covered Infinite Crisis, following the conclusion of that story, DC sat down and said, look, we already have our mainstay characters, basically the people who are the core members of the Justice League. What we need is to be able to give some emphasis to either new characters or use the popularity of Infinite Crisis to basically uh, bring in a bunch of characters that normally wouldn't get a whole lot of, uh, of representation and give them a chance to be seen. And so what basically happened is DC released a line of stories called 52, and it was literally one story every week, and it went on for a full 52 weeks, a full calendar year. And what we basically got were all these different stories involving smaller characters and showing what they were doing in the year between the conclusion of Infinite Crisis and the time the major superheroes basically returned back to the landscape. And so the cool thing is that with the Green Lantern story and the Green Lantern Corps story, we basically join everything a year later. Now, again, a lot of this is really just kind of how Jordan just sort of talking to different people and so on and so forth. Again, it's sort of designed to be an introductory, uh, introductory line of stories. But one of the major emphases that Jeff Johns is putting here is the fallout of Hal Jordan's time as Parallax. Remember, during the events of the death of Superman, Cyborg Superman and Mongol had basically destroyed Coast City. Hal Jordan came back from a space mission to find everything he knew and loved completely obliterated. He went insane with madness and grief, declared himself to be Parallax, and then just basically started ripping through and cut a swath through all the Green Lanterns, uh, basically leading to the introduction of Kyle Rayner as the last Green Lantern in existence. Now, that was the official explanation as it was given by DC during the events of Emerald Twilight. Of course, Hal Jordan declaring himself to be Parallax at the time was him just giving himself a name. Of course, with Jeff John's run, and one of the things we've talked about recently is that Parallax was an actual entity, one of the entities of the emotional spectrum that represents fear. And the result was that Jeff John's basically came back with a retcon and said, no, 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 no. During Emerald Twilight, Hal Jordan was literally possessed by Parallax. And so because of that, um, it kind of, you know, bolsters things a little bit and gives us a, a pretty solid point on the character of Hal Jordan, where he's coming from. But in terms of the fall, out is John's basically setting the stage for the return of the old school Green Lanterns who are presumed to have been killed when Hal Jordan became Parallax and destroyed the Green Lantern Corps and the idea that there's going to be fallout for the kind of things that he's done. Now, at this point, we jump over to Sector 674 and pick up with a guy named Arkillo who's basically told, you have the power to instill great fear. Welcome to the Sinestro Corps. And that is when the Road to Sinestro Corps War basically starts. This is it. This is the only thing we get with the Sinestro Corps, at least this little segment called Revenge of the Green Lanterns. But the funny thing about this is that when this story came out and when it was like, welcome to the Sinestro Corps, people freaked. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't reading at the time. I've actually gone back and look at like old forum posts, you know, Wayback Machine, different things like that. And people were losing their minds. Like they were just speculating all over the place. What does it mean? You know, what's going to happen? It was crazy. You know, that, that, you know, how people were reacting to the whole thing. Those of you guys who were around when this story first came out, I'm sure you can attest to the same thing. People were losing their minds. They were like, what? A Sinestro Corps? Like it was, it was a crazy, uh, crazy thing to go through and just read people's reactions and see them kind of going crazy. But the beginning of uh, Revenge of the Green Lanterns really picks up with the arrival of Tomar 2, uh, the Green Lantern of Space Sector 2813, who's one of the original Green Lanterns that Hal Jordan killed when he was Parallax. And so the first question they have is, what in the world is going on here? Where did he come from? Now, what we're going over here right now is a retcon. That's literally, we're covering a retcon here in real time. Of course, for those of you guys who are new to comic books, retcon means retroactive continuity. It's simply that something happened in a comic book, a comic book writer comes on, comes along later on down the line and changes what originally happened. And that's what Jeff Johns is going to be doing here. He's basically going to be retconning the original Green Lanterns that were killed by Hal Jordan operating as Parallax and show us that they're actually alive. And so again, the cool thing about this is that back at the uh, the Green Lantern Corps uh, Citadel, basically, you know, the, the you know, on the planet Oa, uh, we basically have Hal Jordan dealing with a lot of the fallout with regards to uh, how people view him. And the reason why is because of the fact that when the new Green Lantern Corps was basically being initiated, they were being trained, they were being brought in, word began to spread about what Hal Jordan did when he was 
Parallax, that he basically turned against the Green Lantern Corps and pushed it to the brink of almost complete and total extinction. And so because of that, a lot of people look at him as a traitor. They still look at him as somebody who's a liar, somebody who cannot be trusted. Now, this is a secondhand viewpoint, right? It's like, if I tell you something and then you take it as gospel truth, you believe it because I told you, not because you know it to be true. And so because of that, these guys are basically just kind of going on what it is that they've been told by other people. It's secondhand knowledge at best. And so again, it's, it's, it kind of creates an interesting scenario because what it does is it basically has Jeff Johns showing us what their allegiance to the core really means. Despite the fact that it's secondhand knowledge, despite the fact that they don't know that it's true, their allegiance to the Green Lantern Corps means that they view Hal Jordan as a traitor. Now, the other half of this is that they're also in fear for their own lives. Now, they're not, they don't really come out and show that. Instead, what we end up having are individuals who have basically taken up the mantle of Green Lantern for other people who were the, the Green Lantern of their sector before Hal Jordan killed them. For example, one of the guys that attacks Hal Jordan is basically the next person to become Green Lantern after their predecessor, Kihan, I think is how you pronounce it, was supposedly killed by Hal Jordan. And so a lot of these guys are swearing revenge. They're saying, look, the Green Lantern of my sector was killed by you. I'm the new Green Lantern, and now you're going to die. Or at the very least, they're going to be the absolute hell out of him. Now, of course, Guy Gardner steps in, right? And this is why fans love Guy Gardner, because Guy Gardner's like, dude, come on, man. Like, you're, you're, you're killing me. <laughs> you really think you stand a chance? That's why people love Guy Gardner, is because he's so cocky. He's so arrogant, but he's got it where it counts. You know, some, some, some Guy Gardner fans are feeling hard, and they're like, damn right, Rob. He does have it where it counts. And I'm sure some folks are just like, yeah, man. But uh, but the fact remains here that once the entire conflict is basically quelled by uh, by Kilowog, we end up having Hal Jordan meeting with the Guardians of the Universe. Now, of course, Hal Jordan's response here is, hey, look, Tomar 2 basically arrived here. He's supposed to have been dead. The fact that he's alive means an investigation needs to be launched. Now, of course, the Guardians of the Universe are well aware of the fact that Tomar 2 is alive. But this is Jeff Johns kind of dipping into the idea that the Guardians of the Universe are a little duplicitous. They're not completely honest with the Green Lanterns. Now, it makes sense, right? I mean, when you're the president of the United States, you don't tell the American people everything that's going on because they don't need to know everything that's going on. And even if they did, of what use would that information be to them? You tell people what they need to know, and you let the press deal with everything else. The press are the ones that disseminate that information that give people what it is that's going on. But if you're sitting with the president and he says, hey, look, we're in the situation room where we have this, 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 and this all going on, you're going to be overloaded with information. Whereas when you're given that information contextually based on the situation that you're in, then you can absorb it and you can use it for what it's worth as opposed to just kind of letting it sit in your brain and then pass you by. So again, it's not really keeping people from getting any information that they need. It's making sure they get the information at the right time. But it presents a very dangerous situation because if I'm the holder of the keys and I'm guarding all the doors, you can only get in if I let you. Well, then what happens if I don't want to let you in? Well, then you can't access whatever is on the other side. Information is the exact same way. And so again, it's basically us as you know readers learning that the guardians of the universe are holding information, but the fact that they're not benign, the fact that they are, for the most part, a little mysterious, they're very cloak and dagger in terms of how they deal with the Green Lanterns, it means that they're not giving out the essential information that's necessary. Now, with regards to Hal Jordan, his request for an investigation of what's going on with regards to the reemergence of Tomar 2 is immediately declined. <laughs> it's immediately turned down. The Guardians are like, nope, you do not need to, you do not need to do that, simply because of the fact that the, uh, the, the destination of Tomar 2 was traced back to his intention to arrive on Earth, but having originated beyond Sector 3600. Now, being beyond uh, Sector 3600 basically means you're beyond known space. And if I understand it correctly, you're getting into the realm of what's what's basically beyond the source wall or just at the source wall. Effectively, you're outside the patrolling area of the Guardians of the Universe. And so because of that, they basically say it's beyond our sector, beyond our ability to basically function out there. You know, you do not go there. Not only that, the Manhunters occupy that space out there. And of course, the Guardians basically say the reason why is because of the fact that the Manhunters uh, were able to exist in that area because nothing can survive out there. No no organic organism can survive on its own. Now, of course, we end up having Hal Jordan and Guy Gardner take off anyway, because what kind of Green Lanterns would they be if they always follow the rules? And so again, it's kind of a <laughs> it's kind of a funny scenario, but it's also Hal Jordan being, you know, basically lying, saying, hey, look, yeah, man, of course the Guardians of the Universe sanction this mission. Why wouldn't they? A missing Green Lantern comes back and they want to know what happened. And of course, Guy Gardner's along for the ride. Now, we as fans know Guy Gardner was born at night, but he wasn't born last night. So he's well aware of what's going on with regards to what Hal Jordan is telling him.
The problem is that when they arrive to where it was that Tomar 2 had originated from, they just find a massive amount of Manhunters. I mean, literally just thousands of Manhunters all over the place, almost like a base of operations or a giant factory cranking them out. And that's exactly what this is. It's basically a factory cranking out all these different Manhunters. Now, these are the ones that we had seen and Green Lantern No Fear in Volume 1 when we had this newest iteration of Manhunter whose head was basically a central power battery, or I guess a, a power battery of sorts, and functioned for the purpose of absorbing Green Lantern energy. And so for this reason, with only Hal Jordan and Guy Gardner being here, they're on the ropes and they constantly have to race against the clock because if they spend more than a couple seconds in front of one of these uh, one of these Manhunters, their rings are going to lose their charge and they're going to be completely defenseless. And so while they're on their way to basically racing to safety, trying to find a place where they can uh, recoup where they can basically regain their energies, allow their rings to charge and jump back into the fray, they end up coming across the bodies of some of the most prominent Green Lanterns that were killed by Hal Jordan himself when he was paralyzed. Of course, all this is revealed to have been orchestrated by Cyborg Superman by Hank Henshaw. Now, what this does is it requires us to kind of sidetrack for a little bit, and it requires us to actually jump back to a story in 1996, I think it was, called Final Night. And what Final Night did is it basically kind of detailed the, the last little tidbit of Hal Jordan and Parallax with regards to, you know, the, the pre-Jeff Johns run on Green Lantern. And what we basically found out here was that because Cyborg Superman alongside Mongol had obliterated uh, the entirety of, of Coast City, leading to, I think I said Central City earlier, but uh, in, uh, obliterated the entirety of Coast City, leading to Hal Jordan becoming Parallax in the first place. Despite all the things that he had done, Hal Jordan looked at Cyborg Superman as the one guy he needed to get revenge on. And so basically he fought him at the edge of the universe, basically obliterated uh, Cyborg Superman using his constructs, and that was the end of him. Now, there was a little segment with like Superman Red, Superman Blue, where they met Cyborg Superman and so on and so forth. We don't need to worry about that. <laughs> that was not very good storytelling. But with regards to what it is that Jeff Johns is doing here, this is when the retcon begins to come into play. Because what we're basically told is that after having basically destroyed the body of Cyborg Superman during Final Night, that he reconstituted his physical body. But the result is that he also came across the Manhunters, their programming, what it was designed for, and effectively modified them. So for those of you guys who have been huge fans of Marvel Comics and who are reading Annihilation Conquest, think about Annihilation Conquest basically being the same thing as this. Of course, this comes long before Conquest, but the fact remains, think of them as, as basically being almost identical. In Annihilation Conquest, Ultron's physical body was destroyed, his consciousness took over the phalanx, and he basically began constructing an empire. That's exactly what's happening here with Cyborg Superman. Now, the idea here is that this is Jeff Johns basically teasing the whole, the whole concept of Hal Jordan being pure willpower. Now, of course, this is something that won't really be explored until we get to like Robert Venditti's run with Hal Jordan and the Green Lanterns as part of DC Rebirth, but it was basically the case that, that Jeff Johns was making the entire time. No Green Lantern will ever be as capable as Hal Jordan, at least as it's being portrayed here. Now, the great thing is that Jeff Johns is going to grow and he's going to expand the Green Lanterns, and so we're going to see characters playing some pretty significant roles, and everybody's going to get their chance. Everybody's going to get their, their time in the sun. Guy Gardner, Kyle Rayner, Jon Stewart, all these different versions, they're all going to get their time in the sun. So again, it's going to be pretty cool to, uh, to to see this light shined on everybody. The issue with this is that when Hal Jordan basically overcomes the attempt of uh, Cyborg Superman to override his brain using, you know, nanites and basically hook him up to a machine and siphon off his uh, his Green Lantern energy, his willpower, uh, Hal Jordan basically wakes up Kihon, this Green Lantern that we thought had since been destroyed. Now, the funny thing is that in the moment, uh, Kihon basically sees Manhunters and just starts tearing things up. But then Hal Jordan starts going through and waking up all of these different individuals, Lyra, for for example, and Chance, and you know, Graf Torn, and, and, and Badika, I think it is, is how you pronounce it? I'm not 100% sure, but begins waking up all these different Green Lanterns. The issue is that once the immediate threat of the Manhunters is taken care of, at least temporarily, they immediately attack Hal Jordan. And the reason why is because for them, time hasn't passed. From the time that they had essentially died, quote unquote, until the time they woke up here, it was moments. It was like if you blinked your eyes, or like if you fell asleep, or something like that. No time has passed for them. As far as they know, Hal Jordan is still paralyzed. So so they're living, they're basically still living in 1993, 1994, Emerald Twilight, and the idea that Hal Jordan is a bad guy and trying to attack them. Now, of course, all this begins to, to more or less wind down when Torn basically says, guys, stop. If Hal Jordan was still Parallax, he would have killed us all by now. The fact that he's not fighting is an indication that something else is going on here. And so this is when the air is cleared slightly, and he basically tells them, hey, look, you guys have been here for years. Now, of course, they still don't trust him. <laughs> they still do not trust Hal Jordan. And there's 
no reason for them to, but it's basically a scenario of the enemy of my enemy is my friend in the sense that they're temporary allies with Hal Jordan because it's in their best interest to work together to defeat Cyborg Superman and the Manhunters, after which somebody's going to pay in spades. So what we also end up doing here is we basically pick up with the return of a character named Aresia. At least I think it's, it's Aresia or Aresia. We're going to call her Aresia just because I think it's a much better, like a cool way to say her name. But not only is she prevalent here, but there's also a litany of Green Lanterns, a multitude of individuals who have just gone missing over the years or whatever the case may be. And so, of course, in the middle of these old school lanterns, what we're going to call them, in the middle of these old school lanterns, basically realizing that so many other lanterns are here, the entire group is basically attacked by Guy Gardner, who's been pulled and, and basically attached to the inside of a uh, of a giant Manhunter robot. So again, this shows us what the goal of Cyborg Superman is, to essentially harness uh, Green Lanterns, use their energy, use them as, as literal batteries to power these massive devices that he's made for himself, and begin the process of universal conquest. Now from here, Jeff Johns, and this is really the only time I know of where he really seems to invoke this, at least from what I've read so far, but Jeff Johns really just kind of invokes this easy way out retcon. <laughs> Jeff Johns, I love you, man. I love everything you do, and, and man, I'd love to get something signed by you one day. But it kind of cracked me up when I saw this because it was like, well, I mean, like Cyborg Superman basically says, well, you know, whenever they're in a state of duress, or whenever they are basically, you know, what they're considered to have been dead, uh, individuals from uh, from Graxon or really from the, from the Graxon territories, those individuals basically go through and they experience the equivalent of a Kryptonian uh, healing coma. That's really what they end up going through. Um, it's kind of funny to see that juxtaposition between, you know, what Jeff Johns is doing here and the return of Superman. The difference is that most people, in fact, a lot of people did not give DC a pass when it came to the return of Superman, but they give Jeff Johns a pass when it came to the Green Lantern. Now, I would surmise this is really because of the fact that it's not a plot device. It's actually designed to basically give us something that we wouldn't normally get or something that's intriguing because the survival of Aresia is not important to the story by any standard of measurement. She could not be here. She could still be dead and the story would continue on just fine. It's not like Jeff Johns backed himself into a wall and needed an easy way out. It's not like that at all. Instead, Aresia is an intrinsic part of the Hal Jordan landscape in the sense that the two of them were lovers for quite some time. Now, of course, following Hal Jordan becoming Parallax, the last fig leaf, so to speak, was the fact that Aresia basically said, hey, look, he will come back. Like, he will come back to his normal self. Now, of course, she was killed by Major Force, who in turn was killed by Guy Gardner. But the fact remains here that her return means that there's somebody out there who sees redemption for Hal Jordan. And that's why this is important. Guy Gardner will always be in his corner no matter what happens. You know, Jon Stewart will always be a friend of Hal Jordan. I mean, I wouldn't say that, that he'll be in his corner no matter what. I mean, there'll come a point where Jon Stewart's like, okay, look, Hal, like, you gotta die, man. Like, this is not okay. But Aricia was the one who always had faith in Hal, that he would always come back. She's the bright, shining star in his life. And so this is basically Jeff Johns bringing her back and saying, hey, look, guys, it's not bleak. It's not dark. It's not hopeless. We need to have some hope in what's going on in the Green Lantern landscape, especially with the stories that are getting ready to come up. <laughs> so again, you know, this this fight between Cyborg Superman and, uh, and Hal Jordan is relatively short-lived in the sense that where Hank Henshaw initially gets the upper hand, Aricia's uh, ring activates, she jumps back into the fray, and the two of them start facing off against Hank Henshaw, uh, who is basically believed to have been destroyed. But the fact remains here that with the uh, with the central core, basically, of this planet being destroyed, the planet itself basically explodes, is completely and totally eradicated. And so, jumping back to the citadel of the Guardians on Oa, uh, we of course have Guy Gardner covering for Hal. <laughs> Guy Gardner is, is of course, uh, he's since been made a member of the Honor Guard in the, the Green Lantern Corps, and because of that, he's allowed three strikes until he loses his position and is possibly even banned from the Green Lantern Corps. And so because of this, he basically just takes one of his lifelines. He says, yeah, man, like I gave him permission to go on this mission. Of course it was an error. It was my mistake. Two more shots and then I'll be done. So, you know, just I'll worry about that then. But the problem is he still has to be punished. And so because of that, he's assigned to basically spend time a month on prime duty. And what that means is he's going to be one of the guys who guards Superboy Prime in his science cell day in and day out every day for one month. So it's going, it's going to suck. <laughs> it's a really crappy job. But again, this is basically Jeff John saying, hey guys, lest we forget, Superboy Prime is still there. Superboy Prime is still being held by the Green Lanterns. And the reason why is because as we know with Sinestro Core War, Superboy Prime is going to come back. 
All right, so getting into Hal Jordan Wanted, this is one of those Green Lantern stories that's really, really important. And in fact, there's there's actually a couple of those in Jeff John's run where they're just really important Green Lantern stories. And that's why you'll find different reading orders for Green Lantern in terms of like essential reading, stuff that you can skip over, stuff that you have to read, different things like that. But this story, Hal Jordan Wanted, will be required. And the reason why is because what this does is it sets the stage for the introduction of the Sinestro Corps as well as the star sapphires so again this is pretty important here it's a pretty big deal now initially what this does is it actually gives us a little bit of a prequel in the sense that this is kind of a, a little bit of what happened before this comic picked up so it's really kind of between the last green lantern story arc and this current you know green lantern story arc this all just really kind of took place off panel but essentially what had happened is uh hal jordan alongside jillian perlman going by the name cowgirl so we'll just go ahead and call her cowgirl and uh shane uh, shane sellers who goes by the name rocket man i uh, had basically been taken prisoner while they were on a mission for the Air Force. Now, the reason why this happened is because Hal Jordan himself really prides on the idea of never taking his Green Lantern ring with him whenever he's flying. Now, the reason why this is the case is because one, it gives him a sense of urgency and it allows him to kind of see the danger of the situation. The reason being because of the fact that in the instance, whenever he's flying a jet, the Green Lantern ring is a crutch more so than anything else, but it's also Jeff Johns giving to us the reckless nature of Hal Jordan. And that's really why those two things kind of go hand in hand. With regards to the idea of the Lantern Lantern being a crutch, it's really one of those things where if Hal Jordan has his lantern ring with him, then he knows that no matter what would happen while he's flying that jet, if it malfunctions and explodes, if he flies into enemy territory and gets shot down, whatever the case may be, it would ultimately lead to the idea that he will always be okay because the ring will automatically do what it needs to do to preserve his life, assuming that he loses consciousness. If he is conscious, all he has to do is just fire up the ring and then he's all set and he can rescue whoever it is that's with him, assuming that you know they're falling to their deaths or something along those lines. I mean, if they pop parachutes and they're in friendly territory, they'll be fine, you know, but if they're in enemy territory, he can use his ring, rescue them, fly them back to the United States, and the day is saved. Uh, if he doesn't have his ring, then it means that he has to be on his guard all the time. Now, in terms of the reckless nature, that's the other half of this equation. Despite the fact that he knows that it's necessary for him to keep his eye out on everything that's going on, to make sure that he's always paying attention, listening to the people around him, what it also does is it allows him to basically put his life on the line every single time he flies. And again, that's just the reckless nature of Hal Jordan. But what Jeff John's run is designed to do is to provide so much character development for Hal. And that's why how we see him with regards to the later stories, especially in like Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern Corps Rebirth, seems so different from how we see him here and how we saw him in Secret Origin. Because he basically grew up. He basically moved away from being just so wildly reckless. He was still a little bit reckless, but it wasn't like, I don't care if I live or die. It wasn't one of those philosophies. It was, hey, look, I can be reckless, but I also have to recognize other people's lives are on the line here. And so again, kind of walking that fine line is one of the things that made his character so intriguing for a lot of different people. But the reason why this is important is because of the fact that in his mind, had he been wearing his Green Lantern ring, neither Hal nor Cowgirl or Rocket Man would have been captured. As soon as their jets were shot down, he would have donned his Green Lantern uniform. He would have saved them. He would have whisked off. And then he probably would have gone back and, you know, fought against whoever it was that shot them down in the first place. The fact that he wasn't able to makes him feel like a failure. Now, the other half of this is that in this moment right now, in this particular instance, Cowgirl was sent on yet another mission. She was shot down and she was taken prisoner by terrorists. And so because of this, Hal Jordan's more or less on a mission to find and save her. And it's kind of him basically in this position where he's trying to fix his past mistakes. Now, another aspect of this is that Cowgirl and Hal Jordan do share somewhat of a romance. The difference here is that the romance they share is nothing like what he had with Carol Ferris. With Carol Ferris, it was a lot more intimate. It was a lot more personal. It was really the possibility that they could have shared a life together. Now, that's the old school back in the day, Carol Ferris and Hal Jordan. Really one of the things that, that Jeff Johns kind of worked on with the idea of the characters was to essentially create this romantic tension. Will they, won't they? That kind of thing. You know, now, of course, it really was a scenario where Carol Ferris essentially said, look, you know, I run a business, you work for me. That's where the relationship stops. But the question was always asked by fans, are they going to get together? Is Carol Ferris going to be the lowest lane of Hal Jordan's life? Is she going to be the damsel in distress, the one he always saves, the ones he would go to the ends of the earth to make sure that she stayed protected. And so that seems to be the implication here to Hal and Carol that maybe they'll go along that direction. Now, of course, you know, we know there's some struggle and strife in between, but the fact remains here that with regards to Hal Jordan trying to track down these terrorists, ultimately he's met with the global guardians. Now, keep in mind, this is all post infinite crisis. And the reason why this matters is because of the fact that DC used infinite crisis as a way to reinvigorate and relaunch different characters and teams. It was much 
just like when Marvel had their Avengers disassembled, then they launched House of M, then they gave us new Avengers. All right, with regards to DC's Infinite Crisis, we had the Global Guardians, then we had Infinite Crisis, and then we had the Global Guardians relaunched and revamped as an entirely new team designed for the purpose of giving us a new roster, new individuals, so on and so forth. Now, under normal circumstances, the Global Guardians are superheroes, but the way they're conducting themselves here are as villains. And they were really kind of like a background theme with regards to Hal Jordan and the Green Lantern. We didn't really, uh, you know, we didn't really do a whole lot of discussion with them just because, you know, you'd have like a single panel or a single page, and it would have taken away from the overall flow of the discussion that we were having at the time. But effectively, every single time they made an appearance in Jeff John's Green Lantern so far, the Hal Jordan stories, ultimately, it seemed like they were reporting to somebody else or working for somebody else, and they were looking to track down Hal Jordan and to basically take him prisoner. And so what seems to be taking place here is that someone somewhere has put a bounty on the head of Hal Jordan. And what we end up finding out is that the person that's done this is a guy by the name of Amon Sur, the son of Abin Sur. Now, the reason why this is important is because of the fact that this is Jeff Johns hearkening all the way back to the secret origin of Hal Jordan when he first gained his lantern ring. And the idea was that when that happened, Abin Sur had basically crash landed on Earth and he had told his ring, go find somebody worthy of becoming a Green Lantern. Now, this is where Jeff Johns kind of plays it fast and loose in terms of how the Green Lantern rings function, which is kind of ironic because he's pretty tedious in terms of the nature of the lantern rings who can wield what rings, what determines their worthiness or their ability to wield it and that kind of thing. But on the whole, uh, the idea seems to be that whenever a Green Lantern dies, the ring will basically say, you know, Green Lantern of Sector, whatever, deceased, seeking out a new Green Lantern, seeking out a new host. It seems as though the rings will basically seek out the most worthy person in the immediate vicinity and then just race them back to Oa, just because it makes the most sense, right? I mean, if a Green Lantern dies, the immediate job is to keep that number going. One Green Lantern dies, one takes their place, the integrity of the Green Lantern cores in number is maintained. So there'll always be 5,200 or 5,400. I can't remember how many there are right now. But the fact remains that that number will always be maintained. The issue here is that Amon Sor basically takes the stance that as the as the son of Abin Sor, he should have been the one to receive his father's ring. But the indication here is that it doesn't work that way. The lantern rings don't automatically pass down based on genealogy. You know, the son is not guaranteed to get his father's ring. There's times where that happens. That's true. But for whatever reason, the ring immediately sought out Hal Jordan instead of Amon Sur. And this really seemed to make the sense because of the fact that Amon Sur was on the other side of the universe. And so it was just kind of a circumstance. It sort of worked itself out that way. Now, the reason why I say this story is so important is because what we do is we transition to a place called Salisbury, England. And there is basically some girl that's getting macked on by some guy. And uh, and this guy's, you know, trying to <laughs> trying to make some moves. When she comes across a glowing purple pink gem. Now, of course, this gem communicates directly with her and says, here's the real motivations of this guy. This guy doesn't really care about you. This guy is not really interested in you. This guy is only after one thing. Now, of course, when the girl picks up this gem, it bonds with her and she becomes a star sapphire. Now, of course, again, this is really kind of a cool scenario because all of this is leading up to the formation of the star sapphires, you know, to their evolution as a team. But that's one of the reasons why I wanted to bring that up. And so what we end up doing is we actually end up jumping back to Hal Jordan again. And so ultimately, we end up finding out that there are a group of individuals, I, I believe they're called the Faceless Hunters, um, but they were basically telepathically controlling the Global Guardians. And that's the reason why the Global Guardians were working directly against their normal role as superheroes and trying to track down Hal Jordan. Because of the fact that Eamon Sword had put this bounty out on Hal Jordan's head, really these, these Faceless guys were one of the many people who responded and were using the Global Guardians as a way to track down Hal. Now, this made sense if you were Eamon, just because of the fact that it's really just a way to keep yourself away from being, you know, intervened or being mixed into the whole fray. You know, it's one of those things where if you're going to issue a bounty, you don't do it yourself. You issue a bounty, like you send out a bounty, you hire a guy who hires a guy who hires a guy that initiates the bounty. That way there's so many lines of buffering, there's so much confusion and, and conflicts in there, no one can ever feasibly trace it back to you. Not only that, in the midst of all this conflict and in the midst of all this chaos and so on, we actually end up joining up with Alan Scott and as well as the rest of the Justice League when they arrive on the scene. Now, Alan Scott presents kind of a funny scenario. And the reason why is because of the fact that he's a Green Lantern, but not a Green Lantern at the same time. And this is actually very important when it comes to the character of Kyle Rayner. And we'll have that discussion once we get to like, you know, Ion and the Torchbearer and that kind of thing. But the fact remains that Alan Scott is basically empowered by 
mystical energies from another universe, from Earth 2. Again, it gets kind of crazy. And so I think that's a discussion that's best isolated to context because really it's kind of the power of, of, uh, of Alan Scott that was sort of pushed into Kyle Rayner that makes him so unique. He has the power of the Green Lanterns and the power of the Star Heart. But again, that's really more of kind of like a Kyle Rayner thing. But, you know, Alan Scott, again, I think people kind of find him confusing because one of the big questions they have is we've got the traditional Green Lanterns of Jon Stewart and, you know, Kyle Rayner and Hal Jordan and Kilowog and all that kind of stuff. And then we have Alan Scott just kind of out there in left field. How does he reside? What's the basis behind his power? So we might do like an origin video or something along those lines where it kind of explains the basis behind his powers and what he's capable of. If for no other reason than to kind of, you know, shine a little light on the whole concept of his character. But the fact remains here that with Hal Jordan more or less making his escape, you know, kind of tracking down who it was that initiated all the, you know, all these bounties and the Justice League essentially dealing with the fallout, we end up joining him once he's captured by Eamon Sewer. And what we end up finding out is that again, Eamon Sewer really did all of this just for the purpose of getting a hold of, of what he believed to be his father's ring, of stepping into the rightful heir of the next Green Lantern following the death of his father, essentially taking Hal Jordan's place. But in the middle of all this, we actually kind of jump back to the Justice League for a second, and we actually end up joining with Batman in Gotham City, fighting against, you know, some of his own foes. And then out of the middle of nowhere, suddenly it's Bruce Wayne of the planet Earth. You have the ability to instill great fear. Welcome to the Sinestro Corps. There was a moment where Batman was part of the Sinestro Corps. And it's so cool because they, they basically say, you've been chosen to represent Space Sector 2814. The issue with this is that Batman's willpower is so extreme that he actually overrides the Yellow Lantern Ring. He overrides his ability to take possession of him. And so because of that, the Yellow Lantern Ring basically says, look, you've got too much willpower. You're better suited as a Green Lantern than a Yellow Lantern. <laughs> and essentially just kind of bails out and goes and searches for a more suitable host. Now the ring kind of says that it rejects him and true that's really more like Batman rejecting the ring but this is one of the cool things you know now the reason why this also happened is remember we had covered this in one of our previous videos Batman used the Green Lantern ring by Hal Jordan it was only for a moment Hal Jordan gave it to Batman so Batman could make constructs of his parents and help to kind of move past all his regret and all his remorse over his parents deaths but the fact that he was able to use a Green Lantern ring means he's best suited for a Green Lantern ring as opposed to a Sinestro Corps ring so the Sinestro Corps ring really kind of looks at him as tainted, really kind of looks at him as, hey, look, you've got Green Lantern energy on you. And then of course goes and searches off a new host. But the funny thing about this is that when it happens, Batman's response was like, what the hell was that? <laughs> It was really kind of funny. It's just like this quick thing because it happens so fast. I mean, honestly, it probably takes it probably takes place over the span of like like five seconds, right? Like the ring pops up, Bruce Wayne, you have the power to instill great fear. Welcome to the Sinestro Corps. You'll be subjected to training. He's like, what the hell? And then it's like, get off of me. And then like the ring's like, oh, air. And then it takes off and it just, it happens so fast. He's just like, what in the hell? <laughs> It's just really funny to see that happen. But in the midst of this whole uh, this whole attempt by Eamon Sewer to basically, you know, kill Hal Jordan to, to essentially you know, take over the role of his father, ultimately the ring that rejected Batman binds itself to Eamon Sewer and simply says, you've been inducted into the Sinestro Corps, you have the power to instill great fear, that kind of thing. Now, again, this is Jeff Johns bringing in the idea of the Sinestro Corps, and that's how it works. That's how Jeff Johns does this, and that's why it's so cool. Initially, it starts out as a trickle, a character somewhere on another planet is suddenly inducted into the Sinestro Corps, and that's it. That's the only thing you get. You just get like one panel where it's like, you have the ability to instill great fear, welcome to the Sinestro Corps. And you're just like, what? And then you don't hear hide nor hair of the Sinestro Corps for three or four volumes of books, for like seven story arcs. You don't hear anything. And then suddenly, Eamon Sewer shows up on Earth, tries to kill Hal Jordan, and he's brought into the Sinestro Corps. That's why Jeff John's writing works so well, because we get this great, big, huge, grandiose Sinestro Corps war storyline where the Green Lantern, or I guess the Guardians of the Universe, have to totally restructure how the Green Lantern rings work. Why? Because over the course of these little tidbits here and there, this story here, that story there, that story over there, the Sinestro Corps was slowly introduced. But the longer the stories go on, the more people get brought in, the bigger the whole revelation of the Sinestro Corps becomes. So instead of just one person gets inducted in the Sinestro Corps in a single comic, suddenly it's three people are brought into the Sinestro Corps, and then seven people are brought into the Sinestro Corps, and the numbers just keep getting bigger and bigger. And so it's literally an in-comic book buildup to this insanely good story, because 
because I don't know how many of you guys read Sinestro Corps War. It is amazing. It is such a good story. Man, it's, man, I absolutely love it. Let me tell you something. If God was writing Green Lantern, that's exactly what it would look like. Sinestro Corps War. It is an amazing story. So what we end up doing here is we pick up with the tail end of this conversation, or I guess the tail end of this video. And of course, where Hal Jordan kind of goes to pay his respects to Abin Sur, realizing that Abin hadn't had a son. Because again, this is the first time that he knew that Abin Sur had a son. Of course, he really kind of modifies his gravestone to say, you know, he was he was also a father, you know, paying respects to the family, to the legacy that Abin Sur had created and that sort of thing. But we also pick up in Northern California, just outside Ferris Air. And what we end up having is this woman, the first Star Sapphire that we saw here, crash lands. And the idea is that the Star Sapphire is jumping from host to host, finding a way to reconnect itself with Hal Jordan once again. Okay, so after going through and reworking my schedule, trying to get it all sorted out, <laughs> <laughs> trying to get everything organized. God, man, the biggest problem that I have is there's so many things I want to cover and there's just not enough days to cover them. That's the biggest problem. Otherwise, I'd be doing like different videos every single day and it, it just, it gets confusing and crazy. But Green Lantern and like really because of Jeff John's run, because of how big it is, it's going to be one of those things that we just kind of do where we have room to put it. And uh, we'll just do it on our classic DC day. And then, you know, once like Justice League, when the movie comes out, we'll actually put Green Lantern on hold, cover New 52 Justice League, and then come back to Green Lantern again. But what this story Story does really this this sort of ion story is in a lot of ways it's self-contained i mean really it's not technically part of the greater green lantern story but it does give us some pretty important things with regards to kyle rayner and really kind of elevates him above all the other green lanterns making him somebody of pretty of a pretty high level of significance in relation to every other green lantern ever in the sense that he holds a special place now this will also become important once we get to the idea of kyle rayner becoming the white lantern and all those different kinds of things so again it's really kind of an important bit here but what this does is it actually deals initially with the idea of Kyle Rayner losing his mind, Kyle Rayner going crazy, and actually attacking a few of the other Green Lanterns. Now, the reason why this matters is, remember, we have our video where we talk about, like, the power of the Starheart. And again, we, you'll find that down in the description. But it basically means that at this moment right now, Kyle Rayner wields two sources of power. He wield, wields the Starheart, which is basically all this magical energy from another universe, as well as the traditional Green Lantern powers that are given to him by virtue of a Green Lantern ring. And so the cool thing about this is that while he doesn't necessarily wield a ring per se, uh, he does have this insane source of energy about him. And so again, it makes things pretty interesting in terms of how he functions and in terms of what he does, because he's basically got two sets of powers combined into one. Now, the reason why this happens and what seems to be going on, uh, going on with Kyle Rayner in terms of him being insane is that he'll black out. He'll basically go through these instances where he just sort of lashes out, he'll lose his temper, he'll attack people, and then he'll black out and wake up somewhere else. In this instance, following this attack on these other members of the Green Lanterns, he simply wakes up back at home where he meets up with a guy by the name of Schuler, I think it is. And it's really just him just kind of learning how to be a better artist. Remember, being an artist is part of Kyle Rayner's whole repertoire. Now, the reason why this matters and the reason why this part of the story is being told is because for a lot of people, keep in mind, Jeff John's run on Green Lantern was their introduction to Green Lantern. And so really like Ron Mar Jeff John, these guys, they could not come along and basically just throw Kyle Rayner in there without giving any explanation of who he is or what he's about. Now, he does make small references to things like his past, uh, you know, relationships, the fact that the, the, I guess the history he has with various women have always been pretty much unsuccessful in the sense that for the most part, they've all died. Uh, this really comes by way of the fact of a girl who's basically moved in on the property where, you know, these various artists reside and she doesn't say anything. She doesn't speak. She doesn't address anybody. And when the question is asked by Kyle Rayner who this girl is, of course, Schuler basically says, look, she doesn't talk. But for him, he thinks back, you know, to his first major girlfriend who was killed by Major Force, I think it was, and then stuffed into a fridge. Uh, I mean, there's all these different instances in this character's history where his relationships with women just never really work out. They usually all end up dying. But in terms of Kyle Rayner himself and what he means, the first indication of this comes from the Guardians of the Universe who are basically watching all this unfold. Now, keep in mind, in the Green Lantern landscape, the Guardians are very cloak and dagger. They do not tell the Green Lanterns anything unless they need to know. The Guardians keep a lot of secrets to themselves. Now, this creates some measure of distrust among the Green Lanterns, especially with Hal Jordan, who doesn't view them as necessarily trustworthy, but views them as necessary in the sense that maybe they're holding that information because people don't need to know. But 
again it creates kind of a rift between the two groups because there are often times things where the green lanterns just want to know what's going on but the guardians won't tell them what it is that's happening this is really significant with regards to kilowog and a lot of the members who are part of the green lantern corps when these injured members of the lanterns that were attacked by kyle rayner land on oa and when the question is asked what happened and they say kyle rayner basically lost his mind he attacked us we don't know why the response of the guardians is no one is to intervene with what's going on with kyle rayner you do not offer him aid and you stay out of his way you let him be now again this is kind of crazy because it's basically you know these members of the green lantern corps learning that one of their guys is basically kind of going awry and seeming to have some kind of crisis you know and laying waste to innocent people out there but the guardians are basically saying you cannot intervene on his behalf you have to let him go so again this is pretty tough it's really really hard for any of the members of the green lantern corps to actually do on their own but ultimately they're made to and again we continue to see these experiences of kyle rayner blacking out of kyle rayner not knowing what's going on just kind of waking up in the aftermath of all this destruction and having no idea what's happening now of course this will be explained and we'll find out what it is that's going on but while this is taking place we actually have kilowatt sneaking off a message to a member of the green lantern corps for the purpose of saying hey look kyle rayner's basically lost his mind you have to go out and find him and you have to bring him back now this again also kind of shows us the solace that goes on between the members of the the green lantern corps in the sense that you know salak who basically speaks on behalf of the guardians and kind of upholds the laws that they pass appears to kilowatt kind of asking him what it is that you were doing you know what's going on and then ultimately says look if you hadn't done it i would have now again this is cool because it shows us the standing that kyle rayner has among the green lantern corps remember going all the way back to emerald twilight and so on and so forth hal jordan is always viewed with a slanted eye even if he's a good guy now even if he's fighting on behalf of the green lanterns even if he's tried to repent for his his actions under the name of parallax he's still viewed as someone that can't really be trusted by the green lanterns but kyle rayner does not hold that struggle kyle rayner has always been there he's like the the dick grayson of the green lantern corps he's this bright shining light that everybody always trusts and so because of that we end up finding out that in the midst of him basically passing out and going through one of his episodes that kyle rayner basically stumbles upon mogo the green lantern planet now again this is part of the guardians of the universe plan but we don't know it yet we simply know that mogo is there and the cool thing about this is that kyle rayner begins going through and having these visions of various people that he's had of course one of the first major relationships that he had the girl named alex you know it's it's kind of cool meeting with her because we get to sort of go back and do this tour of kyle rayner's life the women that he's known and the women that he's lost the failures that he's had over the course of his green lantern career you know whether he meets alex whether he meets donna troy regardless of what person he runs into is basically this ongoing concept you know jade the daughter of uh, alan scott the one who gave kyle rayner the power of the star heart you know all these different things come together for this idea of kyle rayner having his own doubts that for him he does not view himself as a worthy green lantern he views himself worthy in so far that the other members of the green lantern corps trust him to a degree he views himself worthy in so far that he's allowed to wield the ring because he has the willpower to do it if, if a ring is what he needs to pull off the things that he does but at the end of the day he does not see himself as a worthy green lantern he sees himself as a guy who's made too many mistakes now this is cool because what this does is it shows us that the ghost of parallax still lingers on the ghost of hal jordan losing his mind wiping out the green lantern corps kyle rayner being the last remaining green lantern it still lingers on it's still very much a part of who he is and what he's about and his biggest fear is that he will become Hal Jordan. His biggest fear is that he will become Parallax. Somewhere along the line, all these losses that he's experienced, all these perceived failures that he's gone through will come home to roost. It's really this idea that Hal Jordan had a huge role in the life of Kyle Rayner and the fact that Kyle Rayner's afraid of falling down the same path. Now, the reason why this is so important is because of the fact that the person we find out that Kilowog was talking to is Hal Jordan himself. And so what's basically been happening is Hal Jordan has been following this trail of destruction by Kyle Kyle Rayner and basically tracing him back to his own particular location. Now, of course, this again brings us back to Kyle Rayner back on the planet of Mogo. And after facing off against all these threats that he's had, facing off against Major Force, for example, the guy who was responsible for the death of Alex, the guy who was responsible for the death of Jade, for these women who were important in the life of Kyle Rayner, facing against Major Force is effectively Kyle Rayner facing off against all the major issues and all the struggles that he has. Now, again, Major Force is not actually here. Donna Troy is not actually 
here. Alex is not actually here. They are constructs manifested by Mogo himself, but it's designed to force Kyle Rayner to face himself. He's basically facing who he is, everything that he's ever done, every mistake he's ever made, and every fear he ever has. The reason why this is important is because this covers the emotional spectrum. I mean, think about it. Fear, rage, hope, death, life. All these things represent the emotional spectrum. Every single one, he's basically proving himself to be a master of. He's overcoming his fear. He's overcoming the fact that sometimes people die and there's nothing you can do to stop them. He's overcoming the idea that life has its own pattern. It has its own form. You know, people are born and they die. He's facing his rage and his anger with major force. This is the first step that Kyle Rayner takes to becoming the White Lantern. So that's why this is so important. And so with Kyle Rayner having a Green Lantern ring, overcoming all these things allows him to effectively cast the ring aside and be a power source unto himself. And that's really the test that the Guardians of the Universe were forcing him to undergo. Now, of course, the answer still has to be asked, why were these blackouts taking place? Why was Kyle Rayner effectively losing his mind? Well, of course, what ends up happening here is we actually find out there's two Kyle Rayners running around here. There's the Kyle Rayner on the planet of Mogo, and there's a Kyle Rayner who's running around tearing things up and ripping things apart. Now, of course, Hal Jordan catches up to the to the bad, to the evil Kyle Rayner, so to speak. And as the two of them end up doing battle with one another, what we end up finding out is the real Kyle Rayner actually shows up. And that's the crazy scenario here, because while Hal Jordan is talking to this evil Kyle Rayner, this evil Kyle Rayner almost seems to be himself. He's talking about the terrible things that he's done, trying to make up remorse, trying to do the right thing, trying to be a good person, but ultimately lashes out and begins attacking Hal Jordan. And so with the arrival of the good Kyle Rayner, with the arrival of the real Kyle Rayner himself, what we find out is that this false Kyle Rayner is a guy named Alex Nero. Now, the reason why this matters is because of the fact that with regards to the Green Lantern landscape, this is yet another instance of Jeff Johns and Ron Mars grabbing these different eras of the Green Lantern mythos and sort of rolling them all together. And the reason why I say this is because of the fact that back when, you know, Hal Jordan was the Green Lantern before he became Parallax, Sinestro was always his main villain. You know, Sinestro was Green Lantern's Lex Luthor, so to speak. But when uh, Hal Jordan was was basically removed from the DC landscape as the Green Lantern and Kyle Rayner was put in his place, DC needed to give Kyle Rayner his own arch nemesis. Now, of course, this eventually came in the form of major force, but Nero was really one of the one of the attempts of DC to give Kyle Rayner his own bad guy in the sense that Nero was basically given a power ring by the Cordians, those individuals in the, uh, in the antimatter universe who were responsible for giving Sinestro his first power ring. And so the idea was to kind of try to repeat the past, only updating it for the modern day. The issue was that it just didn't really work that great. It worked to a degree, but it didn't really work that great. But again, this was basically an addition that was added in the early 2000s, 2001 or something along those lines. And so the idea was that with Alexander Nero, somebody who was basically suffering from mental disorder, that he would be the perfect nemesis against Kyle Rayner. And this is kind of a cool thing here because in this battle that we see between Hal Jordan and Kyle, as well as Nero, Nero is just basically creating all these yellow constructs, these fear-based constructs. Now, again, this is kind of hitting home at the original origin of Nero, but it's also throwing into the idea that the Yellow Lantern Corps is growing in number, that the Yellow Lantern Corps is becoming something to worry about. Now, the Green Lanterns don't know this yet. They don't know that Sinestro is sending rings out across the universe and bolstering the ranks of his Yellow Lantern Corps. You know, all they know is that this guy Nero shows up and this guy is basically trying to confront people as Kyle Rayner. Now, the reason why this matters is because of the fact that what Nero basically says is he was taken by the Cordians. This whole introduction here, he was taken by the Cordians and he was basically forced to become Kyle Kyle Rayner and basically discredit Kyle Rayner as a Green Lantern, hoping that it would basically create a scenario where Kyle Rayner would ultimately be taken down. Now, of course, this was only one stage of the operation. The second stage was for Nero to be captured and be taken to the Guardians of the Universe. And the reason why this matters is because of the fact that after Nero is defeated by the combined efforts of, uh, of Kyle Rayner and Hal Jordan, and Nero is taken to the Guardians of the Universe themselves, what we end up finding out here is that where Kyle Rayner says he wants answers, he wants to know what in the world is going on on here, you know, what it is that the Guardians of the Universe have been doing and so on and so forth, we find out that Nero was basically a bomb, that Nero was designed to basically explode with all this Yellow Lantern energy and wipe out the Guardians of the Universe in the process. Now, before that happens, we do get answers in terms of what it is that's going on. And what we find out here is that Kyle Rayner, all, you know, the, the whole idea with Nero was not expected. Instead, Kyle Rayner was basically supposed to meet with Mogo and Mogo was supposed to basically, you know, force him to endure all these different scenarios, meeting Alex 
and Donna Troy and all the things that we saw with him facing off against his own fears and his own past and so on and so forth. And the reason why is because of the fact that this is Jeff Johns and Ron Mars doing something with Kyle Rayner. And this is why I said we'd wait until around the end of the video to cover all this. When Kyle Rayner was introduced as the Green Lantern, as DC began to progress his character, they reintroduced him as the character of Ion, meaning that he had the power of the Green Lantern and he had the power of the Starheart. The problem with this was that there was no real indication of what this meant. Now, of course, we ended up finding out that he had an insane amount of power, and then he used almost all the energy he had to basically recreate the Green Lantern central power battery to resurrect the Guardians of the Universe and to restore the Green Lantern Corps. The reason why this matters is because of the fact that following that, his power was basically moved away from him being a god and back down to normal levels, but he was still being called Ion. And so the question had to be asked, what does that mean? Is he just, is that just the name he takes now? I mean, does it have some kind of honorary measure? Because there's no additional power to go with it. So what does it mean that Kyle Rayner is Ion? And that was the idea, was to basically consolidate all those different plot threads, bring it together. And it's the Guardians of the Universe basically saying, Kyle Rayner is now the torchbearer. Kyle Rayner bears the legacy of the Green Lantern Corps. If for any reason, the Green Lantern Corps is totally obliterated, they're totally wiped out, the Guardians of the Universe are killed, the whole nine yards, Kyle Rayner, is the only person who can resurrect them from the dead. He's the only person that can bring them back. And so that's what the term torchbearer means, that he carries the mantle and the legacy of the Green Lantern Corps, and he will restore them if anything ever happens. Now, what this also means is that Kyle Rayner is the most important Green Lantern, because if Kyle Rayner were to be killed, for example, and then the Green Lantern Corps were to be wiped out, there'd be nobody to bring them back. There'd be nobody to resurrect them. They would just sort of be gone forever, and that would really be about it. But what it does from here is it it basically throws Kyle Rayner into the fray and it makes him a central focal point for Sinestro. Because now what it means is that if Kyle Rayner is this important and if Kyle Rayner is basically the torchbearer for the Green Lanterns, then now it is, let's go get Kyle Rayner. We have to grab him. We have to corrupt him and swing him to our side. And that's one of the coolest aspects of, of the whole Sinestro core war is just like this race for Kyle Rayner. Now, of course, after this information is all dropped by the Guardians of the Universe, Nero begins to detonate. Nero begins to explode and really almost, you know, wipes everybody out. But of course, Kyle Rayner uses this insane amount of power he has by unlocking the full power of the Starheart, as well as all the Green Lantern energy he possesses, and basically confines all the energy of Nero back down again. But again, this really kind of brings Kyle Rayner back to having someone that has an absurd amount of power. And it sets the stage for the idea of Kyle Rayner being one of the sole individuals out there who can resurrect the Green Lantern Corps, a person of such incredible and extreme power that almost nobody can stop him. Again, setting the stage for the idea of Kyle Rayner becoming coming the White Lantern. Okay, so getting into Jeff John's Green Lantern, I guess continuing on with Jeff John's Green Lantern, we get into the origin of the Star Sapphire. So this is cool because what Jeff John's is gonna do is actually retcon a lot of the existing information with regards to Star Sapphires, but it's also really the first time he's expanded on the emotional spectrum. And what I mean by that is when he was doing his uh, his Green Lantern run, he was doing a lot of things at the same time. In the immediate, it was focusing on stories here and there that were kind of revamping characters. So going back and redoing the origin of Hal Jordan, introducing the Star sapphires and their new origin, that kind of a thing. And the backdrop of it all, the Sinestro Corps was growing. The Sinestro Corps was expanding. Nobody really knew about it. I mean, it was kind of there, but it was something that people weren't wholly aware of. What this does is it says, okay, look, you know, here are the new version of the Star Sapphires, and it just kind of introduces this so Jeff Johns can come back and reference it later on. Now, that's why I say this is kind of a big deal, because the Star Sapphires have a pretty huge origin. I mean, kind of going all the way back to the Golden Age, the Star Sapphires were there, but it wasn't really until DC Showcase number 22 in 1959 that the Star Sapphires played more of a significant role. Now, keep in mind, one of the whole ideals with the Star Sapphires back then, and we'll talk a little bit more about that here in a second, but one of the whole ideals of the Star Sapphires back then was just kind of bolstering the Green Lantern landscape. But what this does is it basically picks up with the idea of Carol Ferris becoming a Star Sapphire yet again. And again, this is immediate. This is fast. The Star Sapphire just shows up, says, you've been a Star Sapphire before. You are the one person above all others that Hal Jordan cherishes. You are going to become a Star Sapphire, and you are going to serve the purpose of being one of us and helping us to basically defeat Hal Jordan and get our revenge and then kind of take over the world and that sort of thing. Now, of course, at this point, we switch over to Cowgirl. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to cover the character of Jillian Perlman in our previous discussions. When we were talking about Hal Jordan wanted and that whole relationship between the two of them and, you know, Hal Jordan's shortcomings and so on and so forth, because Jillian Perlman becomes the next star Sapphire in the sense that Carol Ferris kind of shows up and begins freaking out and, of course, immediately goes after Hal Jordan, immediately recognizing the star Sapphire on site. It leads 
leads to a bit of a conflict between the two, but the heart of Hal Jordan is with Jillian Perlman. Remember, Carol Ferris had made it quite clear that there was not going to be a relationship between her and Hal Jordan. There was in the past, but it was really one of those things where it's like, what's in the past is in the past, let's leave that then. We are co-workers and that's really the extent of it. That's the limit of it. Now, of course, the star Sapphire really kind of hits home at the idea that Hal Jordan still cares about Carol Ferris and how could he not? I mean, they simply just have too much history together. They've been together for too long. They were really kind of associated with each other too much. Uh, they had a very physical and a very uh, passionate relationship together. So it only makes sense that those feelings would be maintained. But recognizing that Hal Jordan's heart, at least at the moment, is with Jillian Perlman, with Cowgirl, the star Sapphire abandons Carol Ferris and merges with Jillian, merges with Cowgirl, which in turn makes her the, the newest version of the star Sapphire. Now, this is when we get into Jeff Johns kind of going back and changing things. And that's why I wanted to wait until this moment to sort of bring this up. Again, this is a quick three issue story. It's not long by any standard of measurement, but with the original Star Sapphire, not really the original, but with the Carol Ferris Star Sapphire, the idea was that at the time, Hal Jordan the Green Lantern was still pretty much new. And so because of that, the idea was to basically expand him, grow him, you know, get people introduced to the new landscape of the Green Lantern and what it meant. But the other half was to basically introduce kind of an antithesis to the Green Lantern itself. Now, Sinestro had already been established. Sinestro was the bad guy. He had a yellow ring. Uh, Green Lanterns were just weak to the color yellow for whatever reason. I mean, we know now that it's parallax, but at the time, there really was no definitive reason given. Back then, it was just their weakness is the color yellow, and that's just the way it is, and you just kind of had to accept it and, you know, go with the stories accordingly. But that was the bad guy. The idea was to introduce somebody who could potentially be a love interest, or at the very least, uh, somebody who could kind of prey on the feelings of Hal Jordan, and that came in the form of his love interest, Car uh, Carol Ferris. Now, the way the Star Sapphires functioned back then, in the 1950s and 1960s, was that they were basically just a race of women who wanted to prove they were better than guys, and that was it. Like, there was no grandiose, you know, huge grand poobah thing, some massive background story. That was all there was to it. They basically were able to mimic the power of the Green Lantern and Star Sapphire became an enemy of, uh, of Hal Jordan. Now, this eventually led into characters like Deborah Camille Darnell, I think it was, uh, who was a, a Star Sapphire at one point in time. It was always this reoccurring theme that kept coming back and it was an attempt by DC to always sort of reinvigorate and revamp interests in the Green Lantern landscape. The problem is that it never really worked out because at the end of the day, there was really no umph. There was no gumption behind the character. It was just an arbitrary villain out there somewhere that no one really understood or knew anything about. And so with Jeff Johns, when he comes back and he says, okay, that whole origin of the Star Sapphires just wanting to be better than guys, that's not the way it works anymore. The way it worked is that in the beginning, when the Guardians of the Universe basically began the process of shedding their emotion, that they went to all the members, all these different races, and said, look, you guys need to shed your emotion. You know, these members of the Guardians, you have to walk away from your emotion. You have to abandon, you know, the emotional spectrum so that you can have logic and reason that guides your lives. There were some that broke away and some that said, no, we are not going to follow this path. And they began to experiment with different types of emotions. Now, a handful of these were, you know, a group of women who basically began to really kind of travel around the universe universe for billions of years, trying to find different aspects of the emotional spectrum to tap into. Remember, the emotional spectrum is not something you can just go and grab, right? Like you can't go to the corner store and say, I'd like the emotion of compassion, if you don't mind. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> you know, it's really one of those things where you just kind of have to unlock it, harness it, tap into that power, so to speak. And with these particular Xamarons, what they had done is they had come across a, a planet whereby it was really like the last remaining men and women, so to speak, or the last male and female. And what they had discovered is that in their final moments, it's sort of Adam and Eve, Eve, Romeo and Juliet sort of scenario, you know, assuming that they were the last living members of their race, the love for the two of them had taken form in a physical object uh, that was basically more like a rock or a stone or a gem of some kind. And the result is that it bonded itself with one of the Xamarons. Now, this eventually led to the formation of the Xamaron culture, or I guess, you know, the, the Star Sapphire group, which in turn began the process of going around and trying to find people, you know, that could be used as their avatars to basically expand their numbers, which led to them encountering Carol Ferris. Now, that part Hard in terms of their numbers growing and trying to expand and so on. That's Jeff Johns grabbing the original Star Sapphire mythos, but that's really the only original aspect of it that he grabs. Everything else is totally different. Because of the fact that the Star Sapphires believe that love is the greatest of all the emotions, what they do is they basically bond, or at least the Star Sapphire bonds itself to a host, which in turn mates with somebody in particular, and then encases all life in this kind of gem construct, uh, basically keeping it in a state of suspended animation. And so if we were to liken this to like a crazy 
person. It would basically be like if somebody believed that you were perfect the way you are, they loved you that much. They wanted to keep you perfect. They would encase you in suspended animation and you would be stuck that way forever, almost turning you into kind of like a trophy or a, a doll of some kind. And so because of that, following the star sapphires isn't necessarily death per se. It's kind of like living death in the sense that they basically encase entire planets in living crystal. And that's the fate that befalls Hal Jordan should he mate with a particular star sapphire. And that's what makes them so dangerous. Now, again, the star sapphires are governed by love and compassion. It's the overriding factor of who they are. Much in the same way that the Red Lanterns are governed by rage and anger, the star sapphires are the same way. But should Hal Jordan mate with Carol Ferris as a star sapphire or Jillian Perlman as a star sapphire, it would basically result in the complete conquering of the planet Earth, the whole Earth being encased in crystal, and that's really about it. And so it's always this cat and mouse game where the star Sapphire will show up. It'll chase down Hal Jordan. He'll just kind of have to evade and that'll be it. Now, one of the other things that Jeff Johns kind of does here is he adds a little bit of comedy in this, you know, where Cowgirl kind of shows up, tries to harness Hal Jordan. It's this idea that like her, her attraction to him, physical and otherwise, immediately seizes control. And it's almost kind of comedic. You know, it's almost kind of funny in the sense that it's just like, oh, I'm running away from the chick who's crazy and just won't let me go. But because of the power of the star Sapphire, because of the fact that it's really one of these things where it's like the ex girl girlfriend versus the current girlfriend, it really just kind of turns into a battle between uh, Star Sapphire and Carol Ferris. Carol Ferris becomes a Green Lantern. At the end of the day, however, where Jillian Perlman is basically defeated, ultimately this leads into the arrival of the Xamarons and a battle between them and Hal Jordan. Now again, it's really this notion that they intend to kind of take him down and put him in a situation where they're like, look, choose which one you're going to mate with. You're going to mate with one. Choose one of them or we're going to kill you. You know, we're going to kill either one of them. And so you have to choose. Now, ultimately, he chooses is neither. He, he says no. He's, he hasn't chosen either one of them. And so because of this, he actually kind of runs up on one of the Xamaron alien chicks and like kisses her. And so the Star Sapphire is like, he's chosen her, you know? And so the Star Sapphire just kind of races off and bonds with this, this alien chick, which results in them having to forcefully remove it, meaning they have to basically retreat and go back to their base of operations. But again, this is not designed to like establish Carol Ferris as the new Star Sapphire going forward. It's basically designed to say, here are what the Star Sapphires are. Here are what the Star Sapphires fires about basically saying we're going to see them return we're going to see them play a role in the realm of jeff john's green lantern again this is basically what he did with a lot of these things for example as part of this story in the backup features there was tales of the sinestro core basically us learning about the different members of the sinestro core that have existed over the years and the purpose that they serve why they were chosen so on and so forth kind of a cool little series of stories we might cover those once we get closer to sinestro core war but ultimately when they remove this star sapphire gem from the head of this xamaron who's been chosen again this is Jeff Johns building up what we're going to see with the Green Lanterns. It's really the first introduction that we get with regards to everything else that's going on. We have, of course, what looks like the Orange Lantern uh, Stone. We end up having, you know, of course, the Green Lanterns, and then we have the Star Sapphires, but there's also four other aspects of the emotional spectrum. And so it was, again, Jeff Johns basically saying, hey, look, guys, here's the first time we're really delving into the origin of another aspect of the emotional spectrum, but there's so much more to come later on down the line. Plus, there's also talk of a war. Of course, we know that kind of being the Sinestro Core War slash, you know, Blackest Night. And so again, it's basically building up and saying the Green Lantern mythos, as you know it, is about to expand by a huge margin. There's going to be so much more that's introduced than you can imagine at this point in time. So again, it was really kind of setting the stage, sort of wetting our palette, giving us an idea of what things were coming uh, later on down the line, which of course, as we know, ends up turning out to be pretty awesome. So uh, in any event, again, this was a pretty short story. I mean, it was only three issues long, not a whole lot of explanation there, really just kind of a chance to sort of give us a new origin for a group that had previously existed, kind of bolster their ranks, show us that there's more to the emotional spectrum, but uh, but yeah, guys. Anyway, if you are new here to Comics Explain, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like, and yeah, I will catch you all later. Peace.